Good afternoon. This is Rod, uh, Vice Chair Rod McMillian speaking. I call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, October 11th, 2022. This evening's Board of Education meeting is being held in person and virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams Live and on BCPS TV. In parentheses, Com Comcast Xfinity Channel 73 and Verizon BIOS Channel 34. In order to be to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is the equity metrics update, and for that I call on Dr. Yarborough, Dr. McComas, Mr. Handy, and Mr. Conley. Good evening. So good evening, um, uh, Chair, uh, Vice Chair, Mr. McMillian, and Dr. Williams, and members of the board. I'm joined this evening, as you said, by Dr. Yarborough, uh, Mr. Handy, and Mr. Conley. Um, Thank you for extending this opportunity and invitation for us to share the latest update to our equity metrics report this afternoon. Next slide, please. This afternoon, we will be reviewing an update to a previous equity metrics report that was provided in 2020. Gaps in student outcomes has been a longstanding issue for Baltimore County, as has uh, the case been for the state and as a nation. This report focuses on the measure shown in this slide to compare student groups by participation, performance, and climate indicators. The table shown displays each measure and the gap indicator description used to identify persistent and widening gaps. Next slide, please. Inadequate student outcomes do not occur in isolation, we understand, but in fact endure over time. BCPS has taken several steps to identify and to reduce achievement gaps for students during the last three years. For this update, three years of data as available were used to identify gaps. A gap is labeled as persistent if it has existed for two or three years. A gap is considered widening if it was present in the most recent school year and was greater than the gap evidenced in the earliest included year, school year. Data included in the persistent and widening column headers indicate the percent of schools within each school level where the identified gap is considered persistent and or widening. Please stay at this slide. Recent findings confirm the existence of persistent predictable patterns of inequitable educational outcomes. The identified gaps may vary in degree or severity, but they do remain consistent across various contexts. And while our gaps exist, we are making progress it's, as some gaps are closing over time. And specifically, we'd like to highlight that we are making progress at the el uh, elementary and middle school levels, uh, specifically in KRA, map reading and mathematics performance for students receiving special services for farms, English language learners, and special education, as well as map reading and mathematics performance for black African American students. Additionally, we are making progress at the high school level where SAT, evidence-based reading and writing, often referred to as EBRW, and mathematics for students receiving services as English language learners and special education. SAT math for black African American and Hispanic Latino students are also showing progress. And while it is encouraging for us to share that our gaps are, um, we are making progress in closing some gaps, we fully recognize that our work is not yet finished. Uh, at this point, I will hand the presentation over to Mr. Conley, who will share data regarding persistent and widening gaps. Thank you, Dr. McComas. Uh, the next two slides provide sample equity metrics to illustrate persistent and widening gaps for student groups compared to peers who are not members of that student group. For example, students who receive special education services are compared to peers who do not receive special education services. For elementary students, sample performance data from the equity metrics report indicate that in KRA for our black and African American students, there's a 9.2% gap. That gap is persistent in 30.6 of our elementary schools and widening in 21.6 of schools. For map reading, for our student group that is Hispanic Latino, we have a 22.8% gap in elementary school and that's persistent in 70.3% of our schools and widening in 43.2% of 
of elementary schools. For MAP Math, students receiving free and reduced meal services or farms has a 27.2% gap in elementary schools, persistent at 83.8% and widening at 45.1%. Next slide, please. For middle and high school students, sample performance data for the equity metrics is shown. These indicate that for map reading in grades six through eight, for English language learners and students receiving special education services, there's approximately a 35% gap, which is persistent in almost every middle and high school. For map math grades six through eight, for our students who are black or African American, there's a 20.3% gap in middle school, persistent in two thirds of our schools and widening in almost 15% of schools. At the high school level, for SAT, EBRW grade 11, for Hispanic, Latino and farm students, there is a gap of 20.6% and 29.2% respectively. For Hispanic and Latino students, it is persistent in 16% of our high schools and for our students that receive free, medu free and reduced meal services, that gap is persistent in 48% of schools. For SAT math grade 11, for students who are black or African American, there's a 24.6% gap in performance, which is persistent in 40% of high schools. Next slide, please. Shifting to climate data gaps, an examination of climate measures in comparison to previous climate equity metrics indicate that all gaps for chronic absenteeism and suspension rate um, that were recognized in the October 2020 report have increased in the current report. This slide provides sample equity metric data related to gaps in chronic absenteeism and suspension rate. For chronic absenteeism, we have at the elementary, middle, and high school, gaps for students who are black, African American, two or more races, farms, or special education. In addition, students who are Hispanic Latino have chronic absenteeism gaps compared to their elementary school and high school peers. And for students who receive English language learner services, they have gaps in chronic absenteeism compared to their high school peers. For suspension rate across all school levels, elementary, middle, and high school, we have gaps in suspension rate for students who are black or African American, students who receive free and reduced meal services, and students who receive special education services. Next, Mr. Doug Handy, Executive Director of Equity and Cultural Proficiency, will share with you our team BCPS commitment to equitable access, opportunities, and outcomes for all students. Next slide, please. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. Board Policy 0100, most recently revised on September 14th, 2021, states, for success to occur for each student in lifelong learning and the world of work, the school system prioritizes educational equity by recognizing and removing institutional barriers and ensuring social identifiers are not obstacles. Further, it states in Policy 0100 that raising achievement for all students and closing gaps among all students are top priorities of the board. Disparities on the basis of race, special education status, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, including gender expression, English language learner status, immigration status, or socioeconomic status are unacceptable and are directly at odds with the belief that all students can achieve. This is board policy. Today's presentation and accompanying detailed report call out inequitable outcomes for student groups by race and special services. How will we, as guided by BCPS Policy 0100, use data to inspire change for more equitable outcomes for all students? As Team BCPS, how will our voice, advocacy, and prioritized actions match the expectations for the achievement of all students as stated and our governing equity policy. Next slide, please. We know that learning is our core purpose and equity is our work. Equitable access and opportunities are critical factors in raising the bar and closing gaps. We are committed to the success of every student in every school. As Team BCPS, we must interrupt inequitable practices 
and implement systemic initiatives, strategies, and key actions to increase student achievement for all students, while decreasing gaps which exist for historically marginalized student groups. As a system, we engage in professional learning for increasing our understanding of equity and cultural proficiency, implement key actions to provide equity in student access and opportunity for acceleration and enrichment, and utilize fiscal and human resources to close gaps. Among BCPS staff, content matter experts use data to interrogate the existence, magnitude, Ooh. persistence, and trends of these data. The Department of Equity and Cultural Proficiency works to build the capacity of teachers, leaders, and all staff to create inclusive learning environments that honor each student's identity. To improve outcomes and experiences for all students this school year, our department is providing coaching for principals and central office leaders and facilitating professional development for all executive directors, all principals, and all assistant principals. At the school level, school staff examine achievement, climate, and behavior data through an equity lens to make data-informed decisions. School leadership teams develop key actions and measurable objectives associated with interrupting predictable patterns of inequity. We strive to promote positive school environments, build quality relationships with students and families, have high expectations for all students, and provide resources to support students and families. Parents, caregivers, and community members, we thank you for your continued efforts in partnering with Team BCPS to support equitable outcomes for all students. We encourage all parents and care providers to be actively involved in their school PTA and parent community advocacy groups. While we have made some progress in closing gaps, the need for continued progress is urgent, and our dedicated commitment to equity work is essential for every student in every school. Thank you. This concludes our presentation. Dr. Hager has a question. Are you available, Dr. Hager? Um, I am, but Ms. Scott can go first. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep, Ms. Scott, go ahead. Okay, thank you. I'm on the phone, so. Um, <clears throat> um, thank you for that presentation. I'm glad that we were able to hear the presentation, and it's a great follow-up to the original equity report that was done. Um, what I would like to know is I see that the gaps have increased and I mean, in specific places like chronic absenteeism. Um, and I had two questions. Um, one, the suspension rate, it increased. Um, and I wanted to see if you could explain where you say suspension rate is black African American and it has elementary school, middle school, and high school, farms, elementary, middle school, and high school, special education. Are those the three groups that have the highest suspension rate in elementary, middle, and high school? Am I interpreting that correctly? It's on uh, slide, I think the one that's second third from the end. Yeah, slide seven. It's Thank you very end. much. Um, mm -hmm. we, we have uh, groups here that converge. So you may have students who are members of more than one student group. For example, you may have a student who is black or African American and also re receives free and reduced meal services. So when we have counts like that that cross over different student groups, um, when we're looking at you know, what's most persistent, our highest uh, suspension rates deal with our students who receive special education services, as well as students who are black or African American. Uh, we have been uh, following that data point very closely and involved in lots of strategies and activities that are both proactive, restorative, and responsive to the needs of our students, schools, and community. Okay, and I would ask the same question as far as chronic absenteeism. Again, it's, uh, I'm sure there is some intersectionality of those groups, black, Hispanic, farms, English language, two or more races, special education. What are you doing to interrupt, um, I guess, sort of chronic absenteeism for those groups? So uh, good, good afternoon, Ms. Scott. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to address that. So at our school level, if you recall some of the board meetings we've had over the past year, I know, for example, one in particular, we had one of our um, 
pupil personnel workers uh, attend. Um, and so at the school level, that's really where school attendance committees come into play. Um, and in the attendance committee, they identify students who are struggling to attend school consistently. Uh, and then as our PPW had shared, uh, they walk through a whole intervention model whereby there's um, outreach to the family, there's uh, as necessary visits to the home, uh, to engage uh, you know, parents in helping to make sure that the students come to school. So it is, is an ongoing and persistent work. Uh, there's no uh, silver bullet, if you will. Oftentimes the root cause of students who are struggling to attend school um, consistently um, is what needs to be addressed. And so uh, that that can vary widely in terms of the needs of the students. That's again where our um, pupil personnel workers and if need be, um, we drive um, a wraparound social supports. It may be that the family needs support uh, where we engage a social worker, it may be outside agencies. So it could be a wide um, array of interventions that we uh, try to build in place to improve student attendance. Thank you. And my last question is just in general, it might be a, a Dr. Williams question or I'm not sure, but um, the gaps are increasing. They're persistent and it looks like they're widening. Although we have had some successes, there are large gaps and it looks like it's the same population of students. So what as a system are we doing to address these children who are falling into these gaps? Because this is not something that we want to increase year after year there there have to be ways to um to disrupt this so thank, thank you. you thank you miss scott um let me just circle back to your previous question every school has a student support team and that's the work that the classroom teachers counselors and administrators meet and talk about students whether it's attendance whether it's academic performance uh, whether it's suspension and so then it's a continuum where they start in-house and work with the school team, include the parents, and then sometimes it has to go across that continuum where we're pulling, like Ms. Dr. Bosma McComas mentioned, um, the PPW uh, social worker or outside uh, external partners to provide that support, so that's a continuum. In terms of a, school, of a system, um, these are high-level data points. We look at every school and we develop the types of supports that a school that school may need, uh, whether it's uh, a different configuration in terms of addressing academics versus social emotional well-being, and so that's where we work with our school side to look at how do we customize that support. Um, there are some schools where may need additional support, and others may need a little tweak. Others may need just someone coming in and looking at their their structure. So as a system, we, we are looking at all 176 schools, and then we prioritize and kind of tier what kind of supports may be needed based on what the data points are showing. And I must just remind everyone, and let me just make sure, Mr. Connolly, the data points that you provided ended last year or the year before? So the Thank you. The data points um, in this report are ending for the school year 2021-2022. Right, right. So each year, our schools look at their data. Um, they customize their school progress plan and talk about what needs to be done around literacy, around mathematics, and as well as climate. Those data, that uh, school progress plan is reviewed by our executive director and team to look at what kind of PD, what kind of structure, what kind of data analysis are happening in the building. So we look at all those tenets in terms of instructional leadership, and then we, we monitor. That's the work of Dr. Zarchin and the executive directors on the school side. So there's a customized plan called the School Progress Plan for every school, and it's monitored by the executive directors. And then if there's additional support that may be needed, then we look at how we differentiate that kind of support. Uh, again, some schools may need just a visit. Some may need a regular basis of sitting down and looking at the structures that exist um, in that particular school. Great. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Williams. Dr. Those Hager, are my Dr. Hager, are you ready with your questions? Um, yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes, please. Yes, please. 
Okay, good. Um, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, I just wanted to start by, again, thanking the, the group that presented, but I also want to thank Ms. Scott for her persistence and um, encouragement to, to get this report together, the first one, and now the follow-up one. Um, I am just really appreciative that um, that this is made public, and I do appreciate the transparency of the school system in, in again, um, showing this data because it, you know, it shows a lot of holes that, that we have, and um, just putting it out there, I think that's really uh, shows a lot for our school system. Um, and so I have three questions. Um, sorry, I wrote them down, and they are <laughs> on my desk here. Um, okay, so the first question is I really appreciate that you looked at the data by – school level, so the, the persistence gaps um, by school level, and my question was going to be kind of what, Ms. what Dr. Williams just said about being able to then identify the schools where we see these persistent gaps and work with them. So I think that question has essentially been answered, but I think that's a really clever way to, to kind of handle this data and to, to um, address the gaps that we see. Um, and then a specific question is, I know with the MAP data, this is used in other school districts around the country. So do we have kind of national comparisons that we can look at where we are compared to other school districts that are similar or just school districts around the country with respect to gaps in our math data? So, Dr. Hager, we provided, yes, we provided an update last year about the MAP results. And I believe Mr. Connolly um, was a part of that presentation and shared a little bit of where we were as well as what the, what, um, NWA uh, reference about just the the learning loss and potential gaps that were happening nationally. Um, and again, I I want to steal Mr. Connolly's um, presentation, but we looked at how we were doing, particularly uh, in certain grades. And then he we even talked about um, just how we were assessing our second graders. But Mr. Connolly, would you would you add more to my response? Uh, absolutely, thank you, Dr. Williams. Yeah, we um, we took a look at the research report from NWEA that came out um, comparing pre-COVID, uh, pre-pandemic, and um, during pandemic data. And what we found was yes, you know, gaps in our uh, MAP data uh, were parallel with those that were across the nation that NWEA reported, but they were actually less in the gaps uh, for Baltimore County Public Schools than what was shown across uh, the nation. And you know, we can uh, certainly pull up that presentation from, from uh, last year to, to illustrate that point. But it was based on our winter map 2020, 2022 data. Um, so that's uh, a positive step in the right direction for us to look at how we responded to a global pandemic in relationship to the national performance of students. While that being said, we still have lots of work to do, and that's our purpose for being here today. Uh, there's a sense of urgency um, with this work because it's it's necessary, but it's also been pervasive and persistent. And one of the things that we looked at was back all the way to 2004, uh, we were able to pull down um, data from MSA, and back then we had adequate yearly progress. And we compared our performance, not only in all students, but across student groups, to that of other uh, large school LEAs in Maryland. And the performance data and the gap data are very, very similar. And so this is not something new. It is something that you know we, as a school system, as a board, as a community, must prioritize for all students in every school. Thank you for that. And I just am um, thinking about the, the report as a whole. Um, me kind of tying that together is, is important to, to note, even though, as you said, that doesn't um, ignore the fact that we need to we need to address our own gaps. Um, but I think that that's important to note as well. And then you just touched on my last question, which really is about the pandemic and that this data, this report looks at the last three years. The last report really looked at pre-pandemic data and kind of bringing that all together um, in the future or, or in some way just to show that, you know, we can't ignore that the past three years have been unique and kind of how that has impacted these data compared to prior data. And um, again, just tying that all together in the future would, would be a nice thing. So that's all. Okay. Ms. Joes. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. And uh, thank you for uh, this data. I also want to thank Ms. Scott, who has pushed to bring this data to the, to the board. 
um, because that is the core of what we do, despite oppositions and resistance with even within the system uh, to not bring this data to the board. And so I applaud you, Ms. Scott, that you have stayed uh, consistently true to that, pushing to bring this to the board. Uh, we heard last week from the state superintendent that as board members, we should consistently ask for this data and the outcomes of implementations. Mr. Connolly, you just said that you have data going back to 2004. Those kids are now adults. This is not a recent phenomena. Um, last week, we saw the state do a deep data dive into all of the state data. And within that data, we saw outliers that some of our schools that are overcoming uh, despite the odds. And I heard the constant uh, generic, we must provide equity as backed by board policies, We board policies. Equity obviously is not just about race or gender, but providing what our children need to succeed, including our special and differently abled children, historically and most disenfranchised, have been those that have been denied opportunities and resources due to systemic racism. You said you're facilitating PD for assistant principals. Principal, who is monitoring this data? What can this board do to provide the strategic support that is needed at a high level? And I would like to ask this, come back to the board on a quarterly basis so it can be monitored. Um, the success plan that Dr. Williams spoke about needs to come to the board. We need to see results. Uh, it's sad that you say you have seen this persistent gaps almost 20 years back. and. Where is the strategic roadmap to fix this? And I know it's not something that can be easily fixed, but we need to provide the support that we can as a board. And again, I want to thank Ms. Scott for pushing this. And as a board, this is the core of what we do. So um, what can we do to provide the support that we need to hear? And Dr. Williams, this question is directly to you. I mean, I want to see results. This, I, I know there was a pandemic, but this is prior to the pandemic, clearly. Thank you. So just to respond, thank you, Ms. Jones, for your statement and, and question, but just to respond to that, um, that's why we come to you as a board to really look at our written curriculum. So we come to you, Dr. Boswell McComas and team, they have a curriculum committee and they analyze, it, do we provide a rigorous instructional program? Is our curriculum rigorous? So that's one aspect of it. The other aspect, how is being taught? So Dr. McComas, Dr. Zarchin, and others visit and monitor how it's being taught. Um, we have put forth some data points and how we're monitoring, uh, particularly our curriculum-based assessments, uh, just to ensure that the curriculum is being followed and is being taught with fidelity. And then we, we have to look at how we support our, our classroom teachers. And so I think when we come forward and make recommendations that we've had an outdated curriculum and we're looking to update a curriculum, um, I would suggest feel free to have those conversations with the curriculum ac uh, experts in terms of how is this going to really hone down rigorous programs in every classroom and then we will continue to provide updates about how our students are doing. Uh, so I think that's one aspect of how the board can support us. Uh, when we come forward and, and present items to you, ask for requests, uh, you worked with us. I think one celebration is that what we didn't have, we now can have on-time data. Before, we had lagging data because we didn't have the mechanism to see how our students were doing right there in the moment when we had our curriculum-based assessment, when we had grades, when we had attendance. We had to wait for that. And so we presented a tool. You all supported that, um, in which we call Power School. So now every school, every actually every administrator, every teacher can drill down and see how students are doing. That's the kind of support that we need to close these gaps so that we have the tools and mechanism, the, the resources, the curriculum to actually support teaching and learning. And then the other piece is, I always have to say as a parent, we can't do this in isolation. The schoolhouse cannot do this in isolation. As you all know, we had our community partnership fair and we've been pushing about partnerships. We've been working with our PTA council. How can we keep parents informed and involved? And what might that look like? So, so 
We will continue to come and present data and share stories about successes that are happening. We have principals coming to the board to present about how they're making a difference. Um, that's hard work. But I have to just highlight the pandemic slowed down a lot of our progress nationwide. And so we recognize that. However, it has not stopped us from doing the work that we need to do. The cabinet as a team, we have equity training every month. We go in and ask those questions. The work that we're doing, how is that impacting our most vulnerable students? What can we do differently in terms of our guidance and support? And it, it ties back to the previous question I think Ms. Scott raised. We have to look at each one of our schools and we look at it differently. Hence why we redesigned central office that we have executive directors focusing solely on elementary, then middle and high school. So they have a concentrated approach to looking at the group of elementary directors working with Dr. Boswell McComas team. What are, what are we doing in every one of our 108 elementary schools? I think I have that number right. And what are the best practices that are happening that we can replicate? So, so this is our work. It's, it's, it's challenging work, but I would just say again, um, the support from the board is coming and when we come forward and say, here's that data, here's the written curriculum we wanna provide, and then we invite you to come and, and watch the taught curriculum. Have conversations with the staff, have conversations with the students regarding how things are going and visiting schools with our executive directors. That's, that's the kind of support I think we need. Thank you, Dr. Williams, and I think this board would be more than happy to provide that support. You do have a good team of staff and um, a good core cabinet that I believe believes in this work. Um, I just want to see results, and I want to make sure that it's clearly put through that it comes through quarterly on this board, uh, that you as the um, officer make sure it's on the agenda on a quarterly basis. It should not have to be requested to be added on like we have to do. Uh, it should be just aut automatically added every quarterly report comes to the board, and I don't believe that requires a vote. It should just be a consensus. This is the core of what we do. So thank you again, and thank you to all the staff that continues to bring the good and the bad to the board. We need to see all of that. So thank you. Mr. Tadlowski, did you have a question? Please. Hey. Okay, so thank you for the thorough presentation, and as Dr. Williams stated, yes, I do sincerely applaud the instant data that we're getting. Um, to piggyback on what he said, um, in terms of the results, are families getting the results? And then if so, um, if it's not already done, perhaps suggestions for things that can be done at home to help narrow the gap, you know, with elementary school especially, you know, read a book once a week, practice, you know, whatever the math unit is. I think that would help bring the community and um, family stakeholders into the solution process. Um, and then I have two other questions, but I'll hear your comments about that first. So I'll go ahead um, and thank you, because we agree, right? This is a partnership in, in order to raise achievement for any child um, and to address their unique needs, we have to work hand in hand. Um, so first and foremost, our parents have access to how their student is doing all the time through Schoology, our learning management system. And we encourage all parents to get their access codes. You can do that through your school. If I may make a commercial break for that, uh, please contact your school to get your access code. Oftentimes, parents will access Schoology with their child and look at their grades and the work that um, is being assigned together and have a meaningful conversation. So I would always, uh, as an educator, encourage that. Um, certainly our, um, our teachers often, especially at the elementary level, send home uh, communications to their families highlighting what's coming up in this unit, what are the um, essential learnings of that unit. Um, and, and we do have, I believe in our math curriculum in particular, um, 
support sheets for parents to help, uh, you know, how to help your child uh, learn their math facts, right? So that they become automa automatic for us, right? Because automaticity is the same as fluency when we talk about reading. Uh, so absolutely, that communication needs to be constant and ongoing. And I would encourage any parent, if you have any concern about how your child is doing academically, socially, emotionally, please, please reach out um, so that we can activate all the resources at the school. Um, in addition, uh, we do send home communications in the upper grades. Uh, first of all, all of that applies to the upper grades as well, right? Uh, we know as kids get older, uh, there is a tendency sometimes, um, you know, we're working to provide more independence to students, but they need our engagement every bit. Um, and so all those things still apply in the upper grades. Additionally, we do send home communications, and this is where I'll invite Mr. Conley, around how students are doing on uh, um, assessments, uh, how they're tracking for graduation requirements. And again, I'll, I'll invite my colleague to uh, add any details to that. Thank you, uh, Dr. McComas. Uh, so we have um, communication that goes home for curriculum-based assessments to progress monitoring, um, in addition to uh, parent conferences and opportunities for uh, parents to engage in dialogues with teachers, uh, school counselors, and other support staff. Uh, we have what we consider, you know, um, data points that happen at specific intervals of time. So for MAP testing, we have uh, individual student report that goes home that provides uh, growth over time as well as achievement data. So if a student has been a part of Baltimore County Public Schools for several years, there are many indicators of growth and achievement over that time period, over the course of several grade levels. Um, in addition to that, uh, we have reporting uh, that we provide for students for PSAT, for SAT through College Board, our contract with them. Uh, in addition to that, we have, through the state of Maryland, any type of state assessment reporting that's done as well. The most important information, though, is the information that's closest to teaching and learning. And when Dr. Williams was talking about highlighting that rigorous and instruction, the quality of curriculum, feedback that we provide to students, and then uh, outcomes that are based on that, that are closest to standards-based learning. That is the most essential uh, way that we can change, in increase, and accelerate learning is at that level. If I may just add one more thing, a, a resource for parents. We do have uh, Parent University, which is filled with a lot of resources. And if a parent has a need and uh, Parent University isn't doesn't have a resource, uh, Suhan, who uh, facilitates all of that, knows who to reach out to for support. Uh, so I just wanted to offer that as well for any parents who are listening um, to know that there is a, a whole Parent University available to support you and helping to support your child be successful. So the Parent University is amazing. Um, just to add, uh, comment on what you've said, I know Schoology is overwhelming for many parents, including myself for a time. What about the idea of since report cards have to be signed quarterly, putting some kind of feedback or suggestions on the report card so that on a quarterly basis, parents actually get specific um, concrete suggestions that they then sign off on, just to add one more layer of Support. possible intervention. Thank you for that feedback, and I will definitely take it back to the team. And then one more quick question. Um, in terms of the data that you presented, which was um, fabulous, is there also data on groups of students that don't fall into the categories that you provided, um, you know, farms, special education? So for parents to get this data for their children who may not fall into one of these categories. Just if I may ask a clarifying question, are you talking like as a, as an in, as a parent, I want to know about my specific children, right? Not the, the student group that they may fall in. Right. So if we're looking at gaps, especially after the pandemic, so that all parents can um, understand where their child falls. Absolutely. I see my colleagues reaching for his microphone, so I'm going to invite Mr. Conley to... Th thank you. <laughs> um, one of the great tools that we have for students in kindergarten through grade 8 is the MAP testing. And MAP data does provide uh, where a student is performing in comparison to school, 
school system and national. And that's both based on a scale score called a RIT, um, mm -hmm. which also that has grade level implications for where we're performing, but then also percentile rank. So that is wonderful feedback, you know, at both um, a content level for reading and math, as well as subtests uh, that look at things such as informational reading, literary reading, uh, vocabulary, and math we may be looking at, like geometry, um, you know, those kinds of different uh, elements. And then from there, you know, when we start looking at that data data is supposed to inspire questions. It's supposed to imp inspire a dialogue. That's where we say that's that point of conversation. What, what can we do? How's my student performing? How's my child performing? You know, what else can we do to support them? Great. And then what about for all students in grades 9 through 12 for any parent, again, to find out if there are any gaps for their children? Sure. So they receive um, you know, feedback based in curriculum-based assessments. We also have PSAT. We're um, very fortunate in Baltimore County Public Schools that we provide PSAT for students at the ninth grade level in the fall, um, for 10th grade and 11th grade. And that gives us comparisons to you know, college and career readiness uh, markers, as well as looking at how students are performing over time from their transition into high school through exiting as, as grade 12 with the grade 11 SAT day. And also the college and career uh, met status uh, through um, their coursework as well as their testing requirements. Okay. And then I'm not trying to sound nitty gritty. I'm just trying to understand because I know the gaps because of the pandemic are really important. So how can parents find out if their child or children have gaps or learning loss from prior to the pandemic to now? Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, so I can, uh, one of the most important things um, parents can do is at the beginning of units, we have built in, um, forgive me, the expression escapes me, but they're essentially diagnostic, t that's the expression yeah, the we use, diagnostic tests, tests yeah. um, at the beginning of every unit, right? And so that is a really powerful um, demonstration for students to engage in that task, right? And that task could be a wide variety of things. It could be a writing sample. It could be a, a dialogue. It could be uh, producing something or making something. That's a really powerful task for the teacher to be able to identify what prerequisite skills uh, for that unit a student knows and has demonstrated that they can perform. Um, uh, but likewise, it also helps the teacher identify what maybe is a gap, what the student doesn't know and is not able to perform going into a unit. That's one of the most powerful moments in time for a parent to have a conversation with a teacher, right? Because then they can come together and understand moving forward through this unit of study, which you know fluctuates a number of weeks depending upon the, the content and grade level, um, through this unit of study, these are the essential learnings. These are the learnings that your child um, was behind on at the beginning. So together, we need to work on that. It may be, again, I'll, I'll use an elementary example. It may be that you know, we need Mary to work on automaticity with her math facts, right? Because that right now is holding her back from more complex um, multi um, operational uh, work moving forward. So that, in, in, in truth, the most powerful time is the beginning of a unit. Um, but the truth is, at any point, those conversations go, can go on. Um, and we encourage our teachers to communicate um, as forthrightly as possible to help parents understand uh, what kind of um, perhaps tutoring, what kind of supports or practice. Oftentimes it's a matter of additional practice for students. I'll close out. Uh, I get excited when we start talking instructions, so thank you. I know I'm out of time. Thank you so much for answering my questions. Ms. Causey, please. Good afternoon. Um, I want to thank uh, the Equity Committee for uh, really keeping up uh, shining the light on this information and um, on the focus that we need to have on every single student. Um, at the MABE conference uh, this past week, the state superintendent uh, spoke to the board members uh, there statewide at, about the deep dive in the data. And while there is very um, a lot of data to be concerned about, he also pointed out that given... Uh, uh, similar student demographics, that there are outliers that are able to close the gap uh, for English learners, for uh, black and white gaps, for um, and also for special education. So um, 
I'm number one, that report just became public. So I would, um, I think it was helpful. It would be helpful for all board members. And uh, I know staff already looks at all the reports that come out from MSDE, uh, but that, that can be very helpful to look at. So I'm curious in the analysis of the data, where are the bright lights shining in BCPS? And uh, has that work been done to identify them and to see what they're doing and to be able to uh, essentially uh, uh, find out the ingredients of that special sauce and then bottle it and transfer it to our other schools? Because this is urgent. So if we have schools that are having success, um, what is the work around finding those best practices? So thank you, Ms. Causey. As you recall last year, when we talked about a data point, we always brought a school to showcase the work that they're doing, where we can't have all 176 schools present, but we look at certain data points and we look at schools that are beating the odds or have relevant practices, and they're monitoring the data and seeing, seeing um, progress. It is our goal to continue that strategy again um, in terms of bringing that information to the board. But in terms of the, the work, that's the work of the system improvement team. That's the work of the school department of schools, get the right name, working with CNI to look at where are those bright uh, shining lights, if you will. Uh, and principals um, share data. They can, we can see their data, and then we drill down to say, how are you closing that gap? How are you looking, what are you doing differently? And so a lot of it is being very intentional. Um, you can't study everything, so you have to really dr drill down. And what are those three or four um, levers that you will pull to really make a difference? And so, as you recall, we had several of our schools to come forward. They talked about analyzing their data. They talked about knowing kids by name and knowing exactly what they may need. And they talked about uh, different types of programming. Dr. Bosman McComas um, talked about the instruction. She also talked about interventions. And she also mentioned some additional time that we provide. So that is, that is our work. That's been our work um, that we started um, when I first came. We were a little sidetracked with everything that was happening with the pandemic, um, but this past year and currently this year, that's our work. We look at it as a system, what's happening across the system, and then we drill down to each level to see where are those schools that are making some differences, and that's the conversations that we have as a school, as a department of schools, that's the conversations that we have with our system improvement team. Thank you for that, Dr. Williams, um, because the, the data statewide is really um, startling uh, and disturbing as well. Um, but when uh, schools can be identified that can decrease a 49% uh, gap down to 14%, um, it, it's really encouraging that we can go out and, and find those more ingredients. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say is, or um, ask about is, Related to uh, the pilots and new curriculum, um, I was in recently in the GTCAC meeting, and um, those folks were not aware of pilots being selected. So um, the suggestion was to include more stakeholders, uh, and also that's time. I believe Dr. Hager in a previous meeting had talked about uh, the potential effectiveness of having more than one pilot at a time. Excuse me, Ms. Causey, you've run out of time. Okay, so I'll just welcome any comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Rowe. So one of the things that I um, am concerned about in looking at this data is that, well, there's several, but we'll just go with special education. What are we doing to communicate to parents who may feel that their children could have special education needs that aren't being addressed, and the gaps show a problem what are we doing to make parents aware that they have a legal right to ask for a referral educational assessment in writing and that the school system has to provide that? Because I hear over and over again, at least in Hillendale, that they'll go to the school and they'll say, I really think that there's something that my child needs some more assistance, needs help, maybe needs an IEP. And the school says, no, no, it's not time for that yet. And then by the time they're in middle school, 
the middle school gives them the IEP. And they actually needed it all along. And that defies everything we know about early childhood intervention. And so I would like to see some kind of public education campaign for early childhood intervention. I, like, I want to turn on WBAL and hear ads on the radio about early childhood intervention and our child fine program. Because I feel like we're not pushing that in the public enough. The public's not aware of it enough. I tell too many people in the grocery store line about it. And that could close some of our gaps if children who have special education needs were identified early and if they were supported. I'll just say thank you, Ms. Rowe, for that feedback. Uh, I know we took notes on the, on the recommendations around the communication campaign. Uh, and thank you for being an ambassador for any child that needs it and whose uh, parent needs that support as well. Uh, as always, this uh, kind of goes back to what Dr. Williams said around SS student support team at a school, which is the first step to help identify. So uh, just again, thank you for the, um, your ambassadorship on behalf of our children that need it. Mr. Offerman, have you returned? We've, we've lost our quorum, so we need to uh, recess for the moment. Okay. I was just informed that we've lost our quorum, so we're going to uh, take a st Excuse me? We're going to recess. I'm very sorry. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is closed session. May I have a motion to go into closed session as permitted by the Open Meetings Act as found in the Annotated Code of Maryland General Provisions Act. Excuse me? Excuse me for that delay. Uh, may I have a motion to go into closed session as permitted by the Open Meeting Act as found in the Annotated Code of Maryland provision, General Provisions Article SS3-305, B1, B7, and B10 to number one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, remo removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction or any other personnel matters that affects one or more specific individuals. Seven, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. And ten, discuss public security. If the public body determines a public discussion would con constitute a risk to the public or to public security, including the employment of fire, police services and staff, and the development and implementation of emergency plans. Can I have a motion? So moved. So, so, so moved, Ms. Causey. Second, Stileski. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Good. May I have a roll call vote, Ms. Gover? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Stileski? Yes. Ms. Jose? Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Ms. Hem? Favor is seven. Good. The first item for closed session is personnel matters, and for that I call on Ms. Anderson.
Pete. Okay, you had asked me a question. Good evening. I'm Rod McMillian, Vice Chair. I'm very sorry for the delay. I now reconvene open session of the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, October 11, 2022. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Ms. Roa Hassan. We will then have a moment of silence and recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. As noted earlier, tonight's Board of Education meeting is being held in person and virtually and broadcast online through Microsoft Teams and through BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73 and Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is the consideration of the October 11th agenda. Dr. Williams, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? There are none. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Ms. Gober, early this evening, 
Early this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Opens Meeting Act for the following reasons. To number one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or other officials over whom has it over whom it has jurisdiction or any other personnel matters that affects one or more specific individuals. Seven, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice, and ten, discuss public security. If the public body determines that public discussion will constitute a risk to the public or to public security, including the deployment of fire, police services, and staff, and the development of implementation of emergency plans. The minutes of the, bo the, minutes of the closed session and information summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. Is there any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, Ms. Gober? I'm sorry. Do I have to do that? I'm sorry, dear. Next item. Bear with me a second. I can't find that, Ms. Gober. Personnel matters. Okay, the next item on the agenda is personnel matters, and for that I call on Ms. Anderson. Good evening, Ms. Anderson. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Vice Chair McMillian, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. I would like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, leaves, certificated appointments, and deceased recognition of service. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits E through 1 through E5? So moved still last. I moved Offerman. Okay, and I heard a second. Second Stileski. Okay, any discussion? Ms. Gober? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Dulesky? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Favor is eight. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments and for that I call on Dr. Williams. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Vice Chair McMillian and members of the board, I'm bringing forth the following administrative appointments for your approval. There are five this evening. The first one is coordinator of school social work services in the Office of Student Support Services. The second one is senior supervisor, planning, Office of Facilities, Construction and Improvement. Third one is supervisor, technology, training and support in the Office of Technology Solutions Development. The fourth is manager, the Office of, uh, of, Office of Employee and Student Hearings. And the last is senior applications administrator, Office of Enterprise Applications. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit F1? So moved, Stileski. Second, Hassan. Outstanding. Any discussion? Ms. Gover, can, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Stileski? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Favor is eight. Our first appointment is Paula S. Davis as the coordinator of school social work services in the Office of Student Support Services. Uh, please stand. She is here with her husband, James Davis. <laughs> she brings over 13 years of experience in Baltimore County. Currently, she's serving as the supervisor of school social work services. And prior to that, she served as a school social worker at Winfield Elementary, Ridge Ruxin, and Battle Monument. Congratulations. 
Our next appointment is Paul D. Mullins as the Senior Supervisor, Planning, Office of Facilities, Construction, and Improvement. He brings seven years of service in Baltimore County. Currently, he's serving as the Senior Project Manager in the Office of Facilities, Construction, and Improvement. He also has had experience at DDG Design Development Group. Congratulations, Mr. Mullins. Our next appointment is Charles T. Smith II as the manager of employee and students hearing in the Office of Employee and Student Hearings. Attending this evening is his wife, Janice. Please stand. He is new to Baltimore County Public Schools. Currently, he serves as the principal of the law offices of Charles T. Smith II LLC. He's also served as a teacher at Paint Branch High School for 12 years, Argyle Middle School for four years, and a teacher at um, Sheridan School for two years. Congratulations and welcome to Baltimore County Public School. <laughs> Not in attendance, um, but watching virtually is Anita L. Randall as the supervisor, technology training and support in the Office of Technology Solutions Development. She brings eight years of service in Baltimore County. Currently, she's serving as the fiscal supervisor three in the Office of Purchasing. She also has served prior experience at PD Diagnostic Systems for over 16 years. Congratulations, Anita L. Randall. And Jared Smolison, who's watching virtually as the senior applications administrator in the Office of Enterprise Applications. He is new to Baltimore County Public Schools. He served as the lead quality assurance analyst in Terra Technology Group. He's also served as a quality manager officer and the lead application software tester in a variety of other positions. So welcome to Baltimore County, Jared Smolison. Concludes the appointments. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow up by his staff. The Board of Education will conduct the public comment portion of the meeting by allowing those who register to speak to attend in person. Registration was open to the public one week prior to the night's board meeting and was closed at 3 p.m. yesterday for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regular scheduled board meeting. Speakers are selected randomly using an electronic selection process from all registrations received within the designated time frame. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board, of course. If fewer than 10 registrations are received, all who registered will be permitted to speak. However, no speaker substitutions will be allowed. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of the board, of this board and this school system, this is not the proper form to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask speakers to observe the three-minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the tone or see that time has expired. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time, and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. If not selected, the public may submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. More information is provided on the board's website at bcps.org under Board of Education Participation by the Public. I now call on the advisory and stakeholder group leaders to speak. Ms. Cindy Sexton with TAPCO. Good evening, Ms. Sexton. Good evening, Vice Chair McMillian, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. We have now finished our first full month, and there are three topics I would like to address tonight. 
First, as I visit schools, there are many places where discipline is under control and students are where they belong, in their classes and not in the halls at inappropriate times. That is great, and I commend those administrators, educators, and staff for working to make this happen. Keep up the good work. There are others, though, that are still struggling, and I ask that we provide them the support and resources they need so our teachers can teach and our students can learn. A safe learning environment must be provided. Let's continue to work to ensure that safety is the priority at every school and work site. Next, I want to thank everyone who is working so tirelessly in the offices of payroll, leaves, and benefits, certification, and more. I know you are getting many emails, phone calls, and inquiries, and I thank you for working through them. Similarly, processing new hires is vital to Team BCPS. We can't recruit and retain effectively if we don't have enough staff to process. It just puts us at a disadvantage. I urge more staff for those departments so we can efficiently respond. And again, thank you for your work in these areas. Finally, to all our educators and staff who have made it through the first month, thank you. Our students need you, and all you do for them is deeply appreciated. I ran into a first-year teacher over the weekend and asked her how it was going. She said it was rough in the beginning, but things were getting better. That was music to my ears. The start of the school year is a challenge, and I commend and thank everyone who is there for our students every day. As we continue to work to provide everything our students need, educators, please make sure you take time for you. Regroup, recharge, re-energize. We need you, and our students need you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sexton. Mr. Ryan Coleman. Mr. Ryan Coleman. Ms. Marietta English with the Baltimore County Chapter of the NAACP. Good evening, Ms. English. Good evening. Good evening, Vice Chair McMillan and um, other members of the board, and Superintendent Dr. Williams. My name is Marietta English, and I chair the Afro-Cultural Technological Scientific Olympics Program for the Baltimore County NAACP. I want to thank you for your partnership, and as we begin the kickoff for our 2022-23 school year, we look forward to this partnership. I will again ask Dr. Williams to ask principals to assign a coordinator in each school for the AXO program. That way we can have more students to participate and be involved in the program. Last year we had over 60 students and we hope to have more this year. I would also like to commend Baltimore County on the implementation of the African American curriculum. It is one that our AXO students will be able to see themselves, especially in the music from Africa, as they perform both musically, instrumentally, vocally, and dance. They will also be able to use it in the visual arts, drawing, painting, and sculpture. And as they begin to see other African Americans who, were, who have made great contributions to the arts and sciences. We appreciate the ability to partner with the county in this area and make suggestions that will also help our AXO students as they prepare for the competition. And again, I want to commend the curriculum department for their work in the development of the African American curriculum. And on behalf of my granddaughter, a freshman at Pikesville High, and the other over 100,000 students in Baltimore County Public Schools, I say thank you. Thank you, Ms. English. Next is general public comment, and our first speaker is Pamela Carrington Randall. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, good evening to the board members, Superintendent Darrell Williams, and Vice Chair 
McMillian. Uh, my name is Pam Carrington, and I am part of the outreach team at the Good Shepherd Church of God in Christ, located at 8301 uh, Liberty Road and in Windsor Mill, Maryland, where Bishop Tony Terrain is the pastor. When our church moved into the Windsor Mill community, we didn't want to be just a building in the community. We wanted to be part of the community, part of the neighborhood, and to provide for the needs for the people around us. As we began looking for ways to accomplish this, the 2020 pandemic hit. While devastating, it did give us our opportunity to serve those feeling the financial burden of making ends meet and getting food on the table. Our outreach ministry decided to meet the challenge by beginning a monthly food giveaway, providing canned goods and dry goods uh, to anyone who could come to the church, to our parking lot, or could make an appointment. In 2020, people in cars lined up for a half a mile in both directions of the church to receive food. And even today, two years later, there are still lines, there's still a need. We continue to feed anywhere from 150 to 250 families each month. We now work with the Maryland Food Bank, the Franciscan Center, For My City Food Rescue Program to provide not just food, but meals that are healthy and items that provide balanced meals. Along with the canned goods and dry goods, we are now able to provide meat, eggs, cheese, bread, and even cleaning products for the households. During the summer months, we even have the opportunity to provide fresh fruits and vegetables from local farms. We've also become a community school's partner with Scott's Branch Elementary School and Randallstown Elementary School. In August, we use our food giveaway to also have a back to school component where we provide 200 backpacks and school supplies to students to our partner schools and to neighborhood children. We ask the local police and fire department to participate, and they have given away safety kits, provide fire truck tours, and chatted with families. And even last year, Dr. Daryl Williams was able to be with us to open the 2021-22 20, school year by greeting families and kicking off the school year. During uh, the holiday season, we do food baskets for Thanksgiving, and in December, we partner with Toys for Tots so that we can provide gift cards, toys, coats, hats, gloves, in addition to the food. Our goal is to be a blessing in our community and to anyone who needs assistance. We realize that it takes all of us to make a strong community, and the Good Shepherd Church is there to continue to help. Thank you for allowing us to speak on this. Thank you for your partnership. Thank you. Timothy Getsy. Good evening. Uh, <clears throat> good evening. Uh, my name is Tim Getsy. I have three children in BCPS. Uh, school system or school safety remains to be a problem in the school system. Everybody has seen the videos, and yet what I haven't seen is a cohesive plan in uh, reducing the amount of violence in the, the system. Sure, the two, our 2023 budget included a, an additional $2 million for 33 school counselors, but across 167 schools, what real impact is this going to have? Uh, only time will tell, but we can't wait for those results. Um, last year, BCPS conducted three virtual town halls on school safety and supportive environments, which is well, great, but they were all heavily scripted with no measurable impact for school safety as the problems persisted throughout the rest of the school last year and then continue into this school year. Uh, now, this Thursday, BCPS is hosting another town hall on the same topic, but why is this administration hiding from the community and conducting another virtual town hall instead of meeting them face to face? Uh, virtual town hall series just sends the message that the box is being checked instead of addressing the issue. Uh, this message is also sent by the board's continued support of the equity agenda. In fact, the board held a special session earlier today to discuss the equity report. When is the last time this board held a special session to address school safety? The equity committee itself has existed since June 2020, but what measurable impact has it had on schools? Sure, they can create posters and index cards to make people feel good, but when your house is burning down, you don't focus on planting some trees. Um, at this point, this time needs to be spent on addressing school safety. You know, it would, all help, would help all students addressing school safety. Do you know it would help all teachers addressing school safety? Do you know it would help raise academic achievement addressing school safety? 
This needs to be uh, done immediately. So suspend equity committee in favor of school safety committee. Um, this, so to show the community that this board is laser focused on school safety. That school safety committee can uh, uh, address a regular agenda item, uh, part of the board's agenda. Uh, while school safety committee is focused on short term goals, the board needs to bring back the legislative, legislative committee to focus on what Maryland laws need to be changed. Uh, moving on to the equity report. The message that is being sent that I have others have received is that white and Asian students do not matter. They are not reported on in this equity report other than the staff demographics. Uh, the report itself is cherry picked data. I don't, you don't have all the data, so I don't know how you can even make an accurate assessment. Um, so what are you gonna do with this? So what? Are you gonna put racial quotas in for suspensions? Are you going to implement policies or policies based on race? I mean, what happened to judging people by the content of the character, not the color of their skin? Um, we need to address school safety, and that is the fact. So thank you. Thank you. Darren Badillo. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Darren Badillo. I'm the outreach coordinator for the Baltimore County Parent and Student Coalition. I know you guys see me here many times uh, discussing many issues in our schools. Um, my main focus is the violence. Um, we don't need to touch back. I did a week, few weeks ago before school started about all the issues with the violence from last year. Uh, but we have a big problem, and I heard it tonight. Um, we're in serious trouble. Um, we have out-of-touch leaders failing our children and our teachers. When you hear the TABCO rep saying that school safety is great, it's fine, it's even getting better, um, that's alarming. That's very alarming. Um, and then we wonder why we have children with failing grades when they're in fight or flight mode every day. Um, how can they focus on learning when they're surrounded by violence? Um, and what I'm seeing right now is that we have children, they were out of school for two years during the pandemic. Last year they come back, you change what and how we teach them. They're being bullied, nothing's being done about it. And now we see this year, we're seeing those children that were being bullied all of last year and starting this year, they're starting to take up for themselves. They have no leaders fighting for them. So they have to take it upon themselves to fight. And you know what? We can, each of us adults can only take so much, and so can children. We all have our limits. I'm asking you guys to step up and fight for them so our children don't have to fight for themselves. And I want to do a brief recap of this year so far, a few incidents that happened. The first week of school, a 14-year-old was shot and murdered on Baltimore County school grounds. Chesapeake High School, two teenagers were arrested with a gun found in their book bag. Uh, Randallstown High School, uh, the next day, uh, another team was arrested, another a gun found in their school bag. Um, in September, uh, the Baltimore County School Board uh, looks for new leaders because they're having bus problems. Uh, Woodlawn High School, on September 20th, Woodlawn High School student is in custody after, after an altercation with the police, and that was caught on video. That was September 20th. On the 20th, again, uh, this police union rep chief concerned about students having easy access to firearms. Um, the 28th, one juvenile was arrested at Perry Hall High School. On September 28th, Strickland Middle School, a child was caught, and there was an article in the Dundalk Eagle about a child tasing girls and trying to take advantage of them in the bathroom. Another incident at Perry Hall, a girl was surrounded, uh, and there was a major incident that happened there. Another incident at Perry Hall happened uh, last week. I believe a student was stabbed. Uh, Towson High School, we see uh, fights of a child being beat for two minutes, two minutes, and nobody helping her out. Then we see another fight at Delaney High School for over three minutes and nobody helping this child out. Then we saw Lansdowne High School where the principal of that school got hit. We see these videos. We need you guys to step up. And one teacher reached out to me and said, Darren, what teachers are getting cases of PTSD from all the violence and crime in school, how can they teach our kids? They need your help. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Lloyd Allen. Good evening. Good evening, uh, Vice Chair McMillian, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board, thank you for the opportunity to speak. 
I am Lloyd Allen, he, him, special educator in mathematics, speaking as an individual. We don't talk about class size. We don't talk about class size, but we've been doing more with less for a while now. Educators are a hardy lot, and we generally work within the constraints that we are given until the system collapses. Let's talk now about an important mathematical concept, Slack. I'll get back to teaching and staffing in a minute, but Slack is a pivotal concept when flexibility is required. Think about how many cars can fit on a section of 695 at a given time. Now think about how fast you go when the beltway is actually at capacity. Because there is nowhere to go, no one goes. Think about baking. Do you use a mixing bowl that exactly fits your ingredients? If you have four cups of flour, would you mix it in a one quart measuring cup? What would happen if you did? Indeed, my grandmother taught me to always add one more tea bag to the pitcher, one more pinch of salt for the pot after measuring my other ingredients. You need a little extra for things to work and you need to account for needing extra before you start. It's like doing a traffic puzzle with no empty space. My first year teaching, I had an algebra two with 32 students. When I had an observation lesson in that class, there was nowhere for my chair and administrator to sit. They brought in chairs from another room so that they could park in the doorways. At the time it worked out, but there was no slack. If there had been the slightest disturbance, the system would have failed. Now it feels like BCPS is creeping up on trying to work at maximum capacity again, but if you're at maximum capacity and something goes wrong, it's catastrophic. Say that a special educator has a caseload that is a reasonable size, but at the upper end of a reasonable size. I'm leaving numbers out of this conversation because reasonable size might mean different things in different contexts. Now say that the special educator goes on paternal leave, long-term leave, or just leaves. What happens to everyone else's caseload? If everyone was already working at capacity, now everyone is working over capacity. This leads to catastrophe. As we move forward, it's not enough to be fully staffed in order to be able to pivot when, say, MSDE tells us that all 10th graders need to take a semester class. We need a lot of slack in the system. In order for the 10th graders to take that now required semester class, they also need to finish out their schedules with an elective semester class. If there wasn't slack in the system, where did that elective come from? Let us go into next year aiming for optimistic overstaffing, starting by looking at the needs of each local school building and then throw in a few more educators for the pot. If we have that built into our plans, then we can look forward to having a chance of success. Thank you. Thank you. John McLaney. John McLaney. Dr. Bosch Perone. Thank you very much. Good evening to all. I have ideas for you, and I respectfully request your consideration. It's about the 8500 and 8501 policies, and I'd like to lump them together. So, metrics are really needed for any assessment of officials, doctors, lawyers. Suggest so that you consider meeting the goals. The board, board members, the superintendent needs to have goals at the beginning of the year and at the end of the year, how many goals have been accomplished or not. Job satisfaction, both the public versus the system and vice versa, just like the President of the United States has popularity or satisfaction uh, numbers. Communication with the public, attending meetings, public forums, answering emails, answering phone calls, communicating in person. Mr. McMillian, I really, really appreciate your two or three words that you told me today. It means a whole lot. I know Ms. Hen answers some questions or concerns online. That's really important. Ability to be able to analyze data, to be a high-tech person, School system is not a desk, blackboard, chalk, and a teacher and students. 
high tech is going to be not only today, but into the future. And last but not least, the ability to listen. This is really important. And you know I have been here too long. I hate to say how long because that tells me more information than I need to. But you know, there are people who just simply don't care about public speakers or emails. And I've seen it over the years. And there are people who truly listen and try to understand and try to find solutions. And the latter one is really important. So I know Mr. Rowe doesn't like late kind of critique of policies, but I really can't keep up with PRC meetings. So this is my only opportunity. I hope you make some metrics that are objective for all of you superintendent, chair, vice chair, and board members, just like doctors. Thank you. Thank you. Mohammed Jamil. Good evening. Good evening. Peace and blessings to everyone on virtual and those who are present. I'm here today to express my gratitude and appreciation for your understanding, diligence, and efforts to strive for equal treatment. It is evident in the proposed calendar, which includes the closings of the schools for children on the two high holy days, each of the two minorities. I would like to share with you, especially those of you who may not be aware of our struggle for nearly three decades for equal treatment. It is not a complaint. It is a short history and the reason for our gratitude. It was 1984 when the board under Dr. Dubell was introduced to the terms Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha, the two high Muslim holy days. 14 years later, the Canada Committee tried to make the playing field even by recommending school closings on two holy days, each for the two minorities. Dr. Stuart Berger rejected the ones from Muslims without any explanation to the Muslim community. It wasn't until 2004 that the Muslim community demanded explanation of the decision made in 1998. Voices were raised continuously for equal treatment, equity, and equal justice. In hindsight, the reason and excuses provided for the exclusion of equal treatment were just that. Consideration for the Muslims was not in the equation of equality until 2018. There's a saying, where there is will, there is a way. Your sincere understanding of doctrine of fairness found the way. Almost all of you, saw I'm losing the track because I have vision problem now too. Almost all of you saw with clear eyes and approved the closing of the schools for the Muslim students. Same decision could have been made two decades ago, but you took the bull by the horn and made an equitable decision. I wish you had seen the faces and joy in the Muslim students and relief for their parents. We are very grateful to you all. I had alluded in the last meeting to a solution to overcome the logistic challenges in creating the calendar. Following the lead of an Arundel County school system to convert snow days to virtual learning days will not break the continuity of class lessons. It will also provide flexibility and aid the calendar committee in creating the calendar. I also thank the calendar committee for their hard work. Please approve the proposed calendar. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Dr. Denise Wadis Daniels.
Good evening. Good evening. Good evening to every member of the board. It is a privilege to stand before you or sit before you and, and present. My name is Dr. Denise Wadis Daniels. I am an educator, a college educator. I am also an associate pastor at Dream Life Worship Center, and I serve as the chair of the executive board of that ministry. We are excited to collaborate with Baltimore County Schools, especially those in the Randallstown Woodlawn area. Recently, I attended the Baltimore County School Fair sponsored by Dr. Darrell Williams. And at that fair, I, was ha I had the opportunity of connecting with several principals, primarily Principal Brandon Glazer of Deer Park Magnet Middle School. That was an amazing event. There were so many schools there. I had never been to anything like that. I heard about it. I came out. And wouldn't you know, I came to look for the principal of Deer Park. And who sat beside me that day but the principal? So I think it was a divine connection. From that activity, we participated in the Deer Park Middle Magnet Back to School event. We distributed school supplies, pocket games, and popsicles to the parents and the students who attended that event. Our ministry also supported the Back to School event sponsored by the Northwest Academy of Health Sciences. We continued our support of the students and the parents in the area by distrib distributing school supplies and treats to the attendees. Dream Wife Worship Center is dedicated to supporting families in the Northwest Baltimore Corridor. We sponsor a monthly food giveaway in collaboration with the Maryland Food Bank. We are distributing foods to hundreds of families since the pandemic. And like my colleague said, the lines continue in that area. Also, during those food giveaways, in the month of August, we also distributed school supplies to anyone that was in the line. During the pandemic, we supported students at Milford Mill Academy by providing toiletries at the, at the request of their principal. We also donate to the local shelter in the Woodlawn area, the Night of Hope. Dream Life also hosted a series of COVID clinics in collaboration with the Baltimore County Health Department. We recently received funding from the Maryland State Legislature to build a community center. We plan to offer various services and resources to families in the community, including building a state-of-the-art develop child development center. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Tony De Cesar. Good evening. Good evening. I'm going to piggyback on Darren a little bit here. Hi, I'm Tony DeCesar of the Patriot Club of America. It was brought to our attention last week by Darren Badillo and the Baltimore County Parent and Student Coalition. The ongoing violence in Baltimore County public schools has reached epidemic proportions. After watching a Fox 45 investigation, regarding a violent attack at Perry Hall High School, we reached out to our local state delegate um, who suggested contacting our county councilman, Wade Koch, which I did on multiple occasions but never received a reply. I'm here tonight to ask you for your help to ensure the safety of our students and our teachers. After delving into this issue further, I was shocked to learn there are reports of assaults almost daily and social media is full of videos of fighting within Baltimore County public schools. To gain more clarity of the escalating violence in the schools, I reached out to our local law enforcement to understand how these incidents are being handled. To my surprise, I was told uh, school administrators would rather not have SROs document these attacks and they would rather handle them within the school administration. Whether an assault happens on campus or outside the school, an assault is still an assault. 
Our schools are devolving into a culture of repeated violence which is not conducive to a quality education and there needs to be accountability. There is no person, governing body, or administrator that can change this culture. It's the responsibility of our entire community. I'm asking you to become involved. Actually, I'm begging you to get engaged because this is occurring under your watch and this will be your legacy. I would like to thank uh, Board Member Rod McMillan for attending the Town Hall in Dundalk, thank you, two weeks ago to hear parents, teachers, and students address their concerns regarding the safety of the schools in Baltimore County. That type of leadership is desperately needed, and right now we need all of you to step up and to lead from the front. I know you have had to make some very difficult decisions over the last two years, and many of you will not be returning for another term. It doesn't matter. Stay engaged. Whether you're on the board or not, stay engaged. This generation of students has suffered through lockdowns, remote learning, and isolation. Now they're attempting to navigate a culture of violence. They need to see strong leadership and people fight for their best interest. In closing, the reputation of Baltimore County Public Schools rests firmly on your shoulders. Parents, students, teachers are all looking to you for the answers to change this violent culture. Since local and state representatives have not responded to their pleas, you are their only hope to ensure. Thank you. Amy Adams. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Vice Chair McMillian, Dr. Williams, and board members. I'm going to piggyback on a topic that's been discussed a lot this evening. Over the last couple of weeks, something dawned on me. I have been so focused on academic achievement because I believe that's what the school system's primary role is. But talking to BCPS families about their concerns and seeing frequent and gut-wrenching videos of children fighting in our schools, the number one issue right now is safety. Our kids are not in environments or in the proper headspace to be able to focus on learning. Our teachers and staff are distracted by a small number of students who disrupt the environment and are unable to focus on instruction or building the relationships with the other students. I have said previously that I worked as a psychiatric nurse on locked acute psych wards. It was a priority to maintain order every shift to protect the well-being of patients and staff. We had clear community standards and clear consequences if those standards were broken. The intent of the consequences was to curb the dangerous behavior. We also utilized positive reinforcement for healthy behaviors. I do not want our schools run like prisons or locked psych wards. I know our students have many outside factors contributing to their behaviors. I know it's natural and age appropriate for teenagers to push boundaries, engage in risky behavior, and seek attention. I know that discipline and respect should be taught within the home first. But while children are in your care, in school buildings, on school buses, they should be safe. Whatever policies are in place now either aren't working or aren't being carried out effectively. The frequency and severity of fights is escalating. So far in the first seven weeks of school, you heard another commenter list the events. The Baltimore County Parent and Student Coalition encourages parents and students to follow the procedure. Fill out the BHI form online and for focus. Fill out a copy, keep one for yourself, and take it to your school. Talk to your principal. Talk to the guidance counselor. Ask for help. Advocate for your child. Call or submit an online form for Maryland Safe Schools. Talk to your SRO or the local precinct police officer. Managing a schoolhouse should not be overly complicated. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Set behavioral standards, implement consistent consequences. I know this isn't a topic we want to talk about publicly. We parents don't want to focus on the negative, but this problem is at a crisis level. Now is the time to change course to prevent anything more tragic occurring in our communities to our children. If you haven't read this book, Why Meadow Died, please do. It outlines all of the missed opportunities for intervention that ultimately allowed one disturbed individual to murder 17 people at his school. We have to focus on education to give in order to give Baltimore County kids the best chance for productive lives as adults. But until our schools are stable, safe, and predictable environments, we cannot address learning. 
Thank you. Thank you. Next is public comment on the proposed 2023-2024 school calendar, and our first guest speaker is Jeffrey Friedman. Good evening. Good evening. Board members, thank you for allowing me to speak tonight on the 23 to 24 school calendar. Tonight, I'm asking you again to approve a post-Labor Day start to next school year and all future school years. The calendar committee is not listening to the will of many families, students, parents, and employees. The committee even said that a post-Labor Day calendar was not possible immediately before explaining how it is possible. Then the results of many surveys were revealed showing that over 50% of all groups preferred a post-Labor Day start. Why do the calendar committee and certain board members continue pushing to start pre-Labor Day year after year? When will our preference be heard? Are you willing to rubber stamp this calendar proposal and ignore the will of over 50% of the people who want the school year to start after Labor Day? Why is this that Carroll County, Hartford County, and Anne Arundel counties, all of which border Baltimore County, continue to hear their citizens on this topic, but those in Baltimore County continue to be ignored? Right now, we have a challenge with a teacher shortage and employee retention. One survey indicated that over 50% of staff prefer to post Labor Day start. If our preference on this important topic continues to not be heard, there's a good chance that more good employees could be lost. At bare minimum, please consider starting the school year after Labor Day when the holiday falls early in September. Please don't make any more excuses. Find a way to do this. If other counties can do it, we can too. I'd also like to discuss this year's calendar and its impacts on next year. While some board members continue to proclaim how great it is, I'm hearing quite the opposite repeatedly from other staff and in the community. When reviewing the start and end dates for all school systems in Maryland this year, we now have the longest school year in the state. Not valuing the summer for staff and students has a negative effect on the school year since summer involves valuable learning, working, and resting time for students and for employees. A shorter summer takes away this important time. Teachers have also continually asked for MSEA Day in October to be a professional development day and not a closure day, but have not been heard. The priority has instead been including as many religious holidays as possible in the calendar. While I'm all for multiculturalism, this approach is inappropriate since you will never be able to close for all holidays. By law, we are not supposed to be closing for religious reasons, only if these impact staffing. By placing a professional development day on a Friday or Monday for a weekend holiday, we are now closing for religious reasons and causing staff to miss important professional development. This never took place before and it doesn't make sense. I'm respectfully asking you to discontinue this practice, which will allow for the October MSCA day to be professional development day. This will also allow the school year to be shorter and will show appreciation to your teachers, allowing them to work slightly fewer than the 191 contractual days. In closing, please listen to your constituents who have spoken loudly and clearly. Start after Labor Day and eliminate weekend holiday professional development days. Thank you. Thank you. Cindy Sexton. Good evening again. Good evening again. Few topics are as hotly contested as the school calendar. Seemingly everyone has a strong opinion about whether schools should start before or after Labor Day. Arguments are made on both sides and whichever choice is made, there are angry, upset, and disappointed people, students, parents, community members, staff. TEBCO has not polled our members since 2019, and at that time, the data was overwhelmingly in favor of a pre-Labor Day start, greater than 88% of the respondents. However, emails, texts, and conversations that I am receiving now are giving similar data. While there are some who do prefer the post-Labor Day, the overwhelming majority is for a pre-Labor Day start. The reasons I hear from these educators almost exclusively revolve around what is best for students. The amount of instructional time needed to cover material and content must be considered. Standard tests such as AP exams have a firm date by which they must be given. Teachers need every bit of time to teach the content. SLOs must be completed by a set time. And again, teachers need the time to teach the content so students can learn it and then show their growth. That's what we're here for, student growth and learning. 
I also hear frequently how this summer slide affects all students, but especially students living in poverty, English language learners, and those who receive special education services. These are targeted groups who likely are already receiving extra services, and they still experience the most learning loss. Educators spend the beginning of the school year reteaching and still need to teach all the new content as well. Starting school after Labor Day makes getting all the content in a more difficult task. The intent of this board when it passed the motion for expanded religious holidays was well intended and a step towards equity that was missing. It does have consequences as we see as we grapple with the calendar. And the calendar committee does have stakeholder representation from many different groups. The committee looks at the options, makes the recommendations based on many factors. I ask you to please respect the work of that committee. Don't get me wrong, I love summer. I love summer vacation. And I didn't go into education because of summer vacation, but it is a nice perk to be sure. I'm in education because what I want is what is best for our students. And giving our students all the time we can to receive instruction is what is best for them. Please approve the calendar as presented so we can all work to help our students be more successful. Thank you. Thank you. Timothy Getzia. Good evening again. Hello. Uh, a little more civil with these. Um, I don't know. One thing is uh, absolutely under no circumstances should there be any consideration given to any type of virtual learning to support off days. I mean, that just that didn't work. Uh, I know it's not being considered, but it's, it was mentioned. Should not be even a, a glimpse of a thought in our head that we're going to use virtual learning. I mean, not only is it not supported by uh, students, but teachers have to randomly prepare for that. So they have to like sort of keep this dual curriculum, which I don't think that helps anybody. So uh, just, just a note for the record. Um, it's funny, we're fighting over a, a, a week. <laughs> I just, just thinking about that, listening to the comments. It's, it's one week, but I think it's important for the families, you know, it's, it's, Sort of the break. Labor Day is that time period that sort of ends summer and you start back to the normal swing of things. So, I mean, I'm ultimately in favor of a <clears throat> post Labor Day uh, start. A uh, couple of notes on this layout. I, I don't understand, uh, it, it seems well documented what all the days off are, but then there's a uh, 26th of April, just says three hour closing. I, I don't know why. It'd be good if there was sort of an explanation of why. Same thing with the 17th of May. Uh, seems like other, uh, all the other days have a reason for those. Um, as far as the, uh, I think there's a lot of risk here with only three days of incremental weather. Uh, I mean, they, in the presentation at the last board meeting, there was, you know, starting back at 2014, you had six days, and then the subsequent years, eight, two, seven, Six. I mean, weather's the weather. So unless I mean, I think last year we had two days off of because it rained too hard. I mean, unless you're gonna sort of be more uh, not so say liberal with days off, uh, three days seems like there's a lot of risk there. I know originally it was five days, but the committee had to make it three days because of all the additional holidays, um, like the. Echo the comments of the first commenter. I think I technically pretty much agree with everything that he said. I think a lot of valid points there. So um, I know they say they can't do a post Labor Day, but what how what would have to be done to have a post Labor Day uh, calendar? Like what would be the advice? I mean, spring break seems like a very long time. The durations seven days in total, or no, six, eight days in total. It seems excessive. But anyway, thank you. That's all I had. Thank you. Dr. Bosch Ferron. Good evening again. I respectfully request 
you consider my two thoughts. Of course, we have one calendar, and I'm a member of the calendar committee since Dr. Berger appointed me in 1995, 96, somewhere like that. Here's my observation. The calendar has multiple moving parts, and those moving parts are the ones that often consume so much time of the calendar committee. Next thought for you is that I personally believe that students are taking off too long. Our job is education. Students' brain is like a sponge. It's not hard labor, it's education. So my thought for you is that the spring break, which I have seen being long, being short, being medium over the past 20 some years in the calendar committee, and the committee always managed to make a calendar at the end of it. I propose to you is really to get rid of most of the spring break because it's, it was designed really when Baltimore County was a farmland and it's really not more. And if you don't have spring break or maybe have one or maybe two days maximum, you know, the, the year will finish sooner. Everybody will be happy. The second thought for you for consideration is that the calendar committee over the years always managed to make a balanced calendar until this year. The first time in the history of this school system where they had balanced pre-labor and not balanced post-labor. And obviously the post-labor is not on the agenda. But this is the first time that it ever happened. They managed always to juggle around and get a calendar done. So if you order the calendar committee to start always post labor, always, it's not their decision, and to make the spring break only one day or maybe two days, I truly think it will get rid of many of the debates in the calendar committee and the function would be much easier. You could save a lot of employee time and the expense that is associated with it. And I think it makes sense. Winter starts post labor everywhere. And how uh, Harford County and Carroll County is not really China or Canada. Thank you, Dr. Bosch. Baltimore County Public Schools starting pre labor when the other counties Thank you. starting post labor. I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean it. Mahava Jamil. Good evening once again. Good evening. October is a statewide bullying prevention month in Maryland. And from when I hear about the conflict and different viewpoints about the calendar, I've had the experience of looking at the calendar and have been an observer for quite a few times. It is a logistic nightmare. And the interest of the students must be put first. If you go to the number one school system in the world, it's South Korea. Do you know how many hours they have to put in? Do you know how many days they have to be in the school? It's not a leisure. Anything easy is going to be useless. You have to work hard at it. You have to make and it convinced the society that our children are now targeted in the global competition. The global competition requires more number of days that the school should be open. 
if just the snow days are the ones that create a little cog in the wheel, then Japan should have only six months of school openings. I think that the reasoning seems to be more personal or a habitual request that we should have 11 days of spring break and we should have this of the summer break and we have this much of the winter break. As one of the speakers mentioned, that the purpose of spring break was so that the kids could help their parents to sow the fields. And summer was for them to be able to harvest. So I don't understand why the 18th century habit of creating this concept of like as if it's an entitlement. It is more important that there should be equity, there should be equal treatment, and that the children's needs should come first. And if the parents are not willing to sacrifice and are not willing to train their children and educate them, yes, we will have crime problem, we'll have all of those things. Discipline begins from home. That education thing is at home. Schools are not baby care and child care centers. The society overall has seen the crime rise throughout my last 52 years that I've seen. The product of that society is what comes into the school. So I think we need to educate the society that it is not the school itself. It's a joint venture and that all of them must work together. So I request again to the calendar be approved as it is. Thank you. Lloyd Allen. Good evening. Welcome again. Good evening, Vice Chair McMillian, Superintendent Williams, and oh, I'll, I'll try one more time. <laughs> Good evening, uh, Vice Chair McMillian, Superintendent uh, Williams, and members of the board, thank you for your time. I am Lloyd Allen, he, him, special educator in mathematics, speaking as an individual. Together with Slack, constraints are an important mathematical concept. Some constraints on the calendar, uh, the student information system will probably break if we go past June 30. Summer school and ESY exist. Winter break and spring break have windows that are legislated at the state level. Students need a particular number of days and or hours of instruction and staff have contracts that put a ceiling on the number of days that we can be asked to work. There are other constraints though. Over the summer, I was assigned 592 minutes of training. 76 minutes of those trainings were due within the first two weeks of school, and this was separate from school-based and ALICE trainings, which were assigned later. Advanced placement tests happen in early May. Those dates are the same all around the world and will not be pushed back if we have a later start date as a school system. Similarly, MCAP testing that we're graded on has windows that are established by the state. Do you wanna have a week before that or a week after that? Special educators are expected to log a particular activity each month, and the school system receives funds from the federal government for a subset of those activities. August is a month. Please ensure that there is sufficient calamity days built into the calendar, uh, that there is sufficient slack for a catastrophe to be less catastrophic. Should you go the route of allowing virtual calamity days, please create appropriate policies to account for the fact that some students and staff are directly effect affected by whatever calamity was disastrous enough to close the school buildings. What does attendance look like on those days? What happens if my students don't have power or internet? What happens if I don't have power or internet? Please recognize that we make plans based on the published calendars. When there is talk of taking away spring break, what happens to the plane ticket during the year? What happens to the plane tickets that I bought to visit my 82 year old father? Also consider the psychological impact of taking things away compared to granting a summer that is earlier than originally planned. And although it's great that we now recognize Juneteenth, it's actually truly great. That feels like an upper bound on an appropriate school year. Please retain the pre-Labor Day start so that we have the extra week of instruction before state tests and before advanced placement tests, not after them. Please consider the importance of pre-service days, particularly when mandatory trainings continue to be added without anything leaving the plate. And again, it is much better received to give something back to people than to take it away, especially when the need to plan for calamity is foreseeable. Thank you. Thank you. 
The next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report, and for that, I call on Dr. Williams. Good evening, Vice Chair McMillian and members of the board. I am pleased to present my superintendent's report to the board and team BCPS. My report includes celebrations, updates, and evidence of our strategic plan, the compass, our pathway to excellence in action. Next slide, please. BCPS celebrates Hispanic Heritage Month. This is a time to recognize and celebrate the many contributions diverse cultures, and extensive histories of the Latinx community. We invite students, staff, and families to share some of their favorite traditions using hashtag BCPS Herencia. Next slide. October this month is National Principals Month. We thank all of our principals for their dedicated leadership and all that they do every day in support of our students, families, and staff. We're working every day to find ways to lighten the load, show appreciation, and provide support to our leaders because our students, staff, and school communities need them and respect them. If you have not already done so, please take some time to thank your principal. October 3rd was National uh, Custodians Day. We thank all of our building services staff for all that they do every day to keep our buildings running smoothly. Their hard work and dedication is valued and appreciated. October is Learning Disabilities Awareness Month. This is a time to recognize the more than 70 million people in the United States who have learning and thinking differences. The BCPS Department of Special Education works to support and empower students with special needs to develop academically and socially as an integral part of school, community, and society. Parents and students, get ready to join in the fun on International Walk, Bike, and roll to school day tomorrow. This is a great way to promote pedestrian safety and physical activity for community members and children. We're looking forward to this week's virtual town hall on safe and supportive environments. During the town hall, the BCPS community will learn about the many actions the system has taken to ensure student and staff safety and there will be opportunities for families and community members to ask questions. Panelists will also address misinformation about the application of consequences for violent, disruptive, and aggressive behavior in our system. Fighting in our schools is not tolerated. Let me just say that again. Fighting in our schools is not tolerated. Behavior such as that, depicted in recent videos, is considered a category four or five infraction, punishable by serious school and legal consequences, including suspension and expulsion. We call on the parent community to help us uphold our expectations for student behavior by engaging with our students and schools, sharing accurate information, and reinforcing expectations at home. The Team BCPS community is invited to submit questions in advance online. The virtual conversation for elementary families will take place from 6 to 7 p.m. and from 7.15 to 8.15 p.m. for secondary families. We know that our efforts to heal, rebuild, and recover must be ongoing. We will continue to move forward to meet the needs of Team BCPS. That's why we have a renewed focus on academic achievement and partnerships in BCPS. We know that we can't do this work alone. We are grateful for a community that remains engaged and committed to the success of all students. Last month, we solicited your input regarding inclement weather plans and community needs. At this time, I invite Dr. Miriam Yarborough, Deputy Superintendent, to share the results of our inclement weather survey and next steps. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Good evening, Vice Chair McMillian and members of the board. 
In anticipation of inclement weather days this year, the state has reopened a pathway to repurpose inclement weather days as virtual school days. To ensure meaningful and equitable virtual instruction during inclement days, and to ensure that this does not adversely impact student learning, key components must be included. Requirements include devices and access to Wi-Fi, accommodations, communications process and attestations, and in order for us to receive stakeholder feedback to inform our plan, we launched a community survey last month. A total of 26,923 responses were received regarding virtual inclement weather days. 329 respondents completed the survey in Spanish. Next slide, please. Respondents included 6,988 staff members, 590 elementary students, 2,101 secondary students, 16,661 parent guardians, and 583 community members. Our community was clear when we asked if families wanted BCPS to implement traditional inclement weather days this year, in other words, closing school, the overwhelming majority said yes. 88% of our respondents indicated yes or they were neutral. When asked about extending the school year, 86% of the respondents answered no or neutral. Additionally, 81% of respondents do not support the use of holidays and shortening spring break to address additional school closures. Finally, 78% of the BCPS community supported transition to virtual after five traditional snow days. In summary, stakeholders shared the following information. Traditional snow days are valued by students, staff, and families. Transition to virtual days is not the preferred method of learning for our students and youngest learners. Staff, students, and parents do not want the school year to extend beyond the last scheduled day of school, and staff, students, and parents are not in favor of reducing spring break or other holidays to make up for inclement weather days. As part of the application process, MSDE requires school systems to ensure that all students and teachers have the necessary devices and access to Wi-Fi for virtual inclement weather days. BCPS maintains a one-to-one -one device ratio pre-kindergarten through 12th grade. The Department of Information Technology will continue to implement remote tech support for students. Additionally, BCPS have pro has provided wireless hotspots to all requesting families to ensure access to internet from home. To date, BCPS has more than 3,000 student deployed hotspots. School systems must also be able to implement a student's current IEP during the in virtual inclement weather day. BCPS will offer the full continuum of educational services and a variety of alternative delivery models to meet the needs of students. BCPS will provide related services through individual or small group virtual therapy sessions, child find screening and evaluations for students age three to five will be available and conducted virtually as appropriate. Evaluations conducted by occupational therapists, physical therapists, speech and language pathologists, and other related service providers may be conducted virtually as appropriate. Communication is the last key component of the required plan. In the event of forecasted inclement weather, Baltimore County Public Schools will include information regarding a synchronous virtual instruction day as part of the system communication that would be sent out via email, social media, telephone, and website emergency alert. Schools would operate on a two-hour delay schedule to meet synchronous learning requirements and allow teachers an opportunity to adjust lessons for virtual instruction. Staff and students 
would, will be reminded to take devices and chargers home in preparation for virtual instruction. If this proposed plan is approved by MSDE, BCPS will send a communication to all stakeholders to inform them of the virtual inclement weather day plans for the school year, including detailed guidance for implementation. Lastly, school systems that transition to virtual inclement weather days must attest to the following. A minimum of four hours of synchronous instruction for all students. Attendance will be taken for all students and teachers during the day. There must be opportunities for students to make up missed work. The virtual inclement weather day plan will be posted on the local sy school system website and the link provided to MSDE upon approval. And finally, the virtual inclement weather day plan was presented at a publicly accessible local school system board meeting. Based on the feedback of our stakeholders and input gathered, we plan to move the following plan forward to MSDE. BCPS will include five traditional inclement weather days for the 22-23 school year. If there are more than five days this year, BCPS will transition to virtual inclement weather days for days six and beyond. If this plan is approved by MC MSDE, we will communicate the plan to Team BCPS. Communication will include the overall components of the plan, rationale, and easily accessible resources for the community in preparation for implementation. So I would like to first uh, wish our students in grades 9 to 11 um, best wishes as they uh, partake, partake in the PSAT administration on tomorrow. And then finally, we will continue to update the board, our community, and team BCPS during these exciting times. And welcome back to school, and thank you very much. Board members, if you have any questions, please submit those to Dr. Williams. Thank you very much. There's no chair report tonight. We're going to move to letter J. The next item on the agenda is the student board members report. And for that, I call on Ms. Hassan. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. First of all, thank you to everyone who is here in the room, virtually um, participating, watching this later. Um, I see you. Thank you so much for, for participating and, and being active um, in such a position and, and being a part of the community. I promise it is seen, it is heard, and it is valued, um, regardless of whatever position you hold. Um, whether it is on the board or not on the board, your voice matters, and your voice is essential to making these immense decisions. Today, however, before I talk about anything else, I want to take a moment to honor a fond mentor of mine. Almost a month ago, Miss Nora Murray passed away. Miss Murray was many things, and a friend was the most important part of her character. Miss Murray served BCPS for over eight years, most recently serving Baltimore County, serving as Baltimore County Student Council's advisor. I was fortunate to know her and the light she shone on every single person she encountered. Miss Murray loved students unconditionally and never failed to remind everyone around her how much she loved us. She made us all feel so loved and seen, teaching us to extend that blessing to everyone we meet. Miss Murray was the kindest person I know, and we miss her very, very dearly. So thank you, Miss Murray. May we never forget you and your legacy on BCPS. May we forever emulate your light and your love. So thank you, Ms. Murray. May she rest in peace. This week, this past week, along with board members, oh, sorry, I have to like take a moment to move on from that. <laughs> along with board members, I had the opportunity to attend Maeve's annual conference. I had the privilege of meeting board members, including some outstanding student members from across the state of Maryland and remind each other why we're here. We are here to act, and I think the keynote speaker said it best, I know Dr. William can attest, that we are turning equity into action. We are turning our thoughts and, and our words into actions, which becomes our destiny on this Board of Education. 
the actions that we take in our communities, in our homes, on this dais will impact students for generations. Every single word we say ha ricochets into the walls of our establishment, into the walls of our school system, and we make change. We do make change. And I, I say this more to, to students, too, um, because I do have the privilege of, of serving as one student representing 111,000 students. We are so, we have power. We are that power. I cannot wait to see your powerful and outstanding voices here on the dais, after me, during me, all of that. Because we are, our power is immeasurable. And I've said that, I think, for the past two years, and I will continue to say that, because that is the most important part of any school system. The reflection of a school system is, most importantly, its students. And I'd like to give a huge, huge, huge shout out these past two-ish months um, to the students who have shown up, but also to the students who have not yet had the opportunity to do so. And remember that we are fighting for them just as we are fighting for anyone else. So a huge shout out to those who are taking the PSAT tomorrow, to our middle school students. I know middle school's hard enough. I'm trying not to remember. Um, but also to our seniors who are getting ready to submit their early action applications and early decision applications, which are due November 1st. So seniors, if you haven't filled out the FAFSA application, please, 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 please do so now um, before it's a little bit too late. So um, again, a huge shout out to students, staff, administration for all of the work you do. And today I'm just going to take a moment to appreciate all of the work that we put in and continue to doing the work rather than just talking about it. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session. And for that, I call on Mr. Mercedes. Good evening. As you know, earlier tonight you met in closed session in your quasi-judicial capacity and rendered a decision in case number HE22-39. Now would be the appropriate time to confirm the vote taken on that matter. May I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session on hearing examiner's case HE22-39 and authorize Ms. Gover to side for those board members not physically present. So move Stileski. Can I have a second, please? Second, Causey. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, Ms. Gober? Ms. Rowe? Recuse. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Jaleski? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Favor is seven. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is contract awards, and tonight I will be presenting as the vice chair of the Building and Contracts Committee. Members of the board, the board's Building and Contracts Committee met yesterday, Monday, October 10th, 2022. Items L through 1 through L14 are being forwarded to the full board for approval. Now, do I have a motion to approve items L1 through L14? No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. So moved, Roe. Any discussion? And I see Ms. Hager has questions. Ms. Hager, please. Dr. Hager. Um, thank you. Yeah, I have questions on numbers uh, 2, 10, and 13. So should I just, uh, they're short questions, I think. So, um, but just to give staff uh, a heads up. Um, so on number two, which is the pre qualification of childcare providers. Um, I was just curious, it sounds like this is to facilitate an extended care before and after care program. I know the title says pre-qualification, but, but given the price tag, I assume that means to operate the program. And um, how many schools would this program be in? 
Um, yes, we appreciate the uh, question. That is the the cost uh, for uh, 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 for the entire program. And uh, can you repeat the second question, second part of that question? I'm sure. Uh, and how many how many schools would this would this uh, before and after care program operate in? Hi, Dr. Hager. This is Melissa Wisted. So um, we had presented this a few months back at curriculum committee through the Community Schools Concentration of Poverty Grant. So we've always um, had different providers that families could choose to pay for before or after school care. And now that certain schools have the Concentration of Poverty Grant, we engaged in a contract a few months ago um, for them to use those funds. And so the reason it's coming back this month is because they're adding two, I believe, vendors to the contract. So the schools, uh, obviously any school could use their operating dollars if they wanted to support families, but it is really the 38 community schools that will have that option because they'll have those additional funds. That's wonderful. Thank you for that explanation. That's, that's really good to hear. Sure. Um, uh, Mr. McMillian, would you like me to go on, or does anyone else, do you want to see if others have questions about that contract, or how do you want me to do it? Please continue, Dr. Hager. Okay. Um, I'll actually jump to number 13 because it's a pretty simple question. Um, it's just for screen printing, and um, the reason I, uh, I wanted to ask a question is way back when I was in high school, School. Um, part of our uh, one of our technical programs at my high school was a screen printing program, and so we did. Uh, we had all the equipment in the high school and did the screen printing for different activities and for other schools as well. And it sounds like this is something that we're contracting out to someone else to do. I just didn't know if, if this is part of any of our um, plans moving forward for our different technical programs to do any of this in house. Um, it just again struck me. It made me remember back in, back in the day when we had that. I am aware that we have a printing program as part of the CTE um, programs. I'm not sure of the school, and I do not believe it, imp it includes any printing on apparel. I believe it's paper and other items. Okay, again, it was just um, something that struck me uh, thinking about how we're expanding our CT CTE programs and contracting out to vendors when, when we may have the ability to do things in-house um, it was just something that I wanted to ask about. Um, and then last but not least, I'm sure you were expecting someone to ask this question about the workman's comp contract. Um, I just wanted to know the explanation for a $54 million modification. Um, and I apologize for not being able to listen to the budget committee meeting, but um, if someone or if someone could um, explain that, I'd really appreciate it. Sure. Um, this was actually was a question uh, topic of, of uh, during the committee meeting last night. And the important thing is, is this actually also now includes the, uh, uh, in the inclusion of the claims reimbursement. In, the, in past contracts that we brought forward, we did not include that amount, and we probably should have, so we've, we've, we've determined going forward that we're going to include the claims reimbursement that flows through to the vendor as well. So it's no real change. It's just a, this is a more transparent way of, 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 uh, of viewing the contract. Okay. So it's not, a, it's not that we're paying out any exorbitant additional funds. It's just, it's just packaged differently. Is that what you, you, you got it. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. No, that, that's really helpful. Uh, those are all my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Causey. Uh, just to dovetail with Dr. Hager, um, is it possible that the um, uh, contract authority form could break out the amounts related to the uh, workman's comp for the management piece and then the we, That's we certainly could going forward. I think the uh, if you look at the previous contract spending authority, that basically is if 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 I'm correct, that's the um, the 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 part that we're actually pay, paying the vendor versus the the 50 uh, additional is uh, actual claims. So that's kind of the breakout uh, there. But we can certainly make that a um, in a future contract as we bring it forward, we can break it out better so so you know the difference. Thank you. And is it in the increased um, 
management costs, is that related to uh, increasing number of claims or that we have less staff in-house to manage the process? What is the... I don't believe that this is this is not an increase. It's, it's, no. We're extending the contract for five years. Mm -hmm. So part of the cost is the administration extended administration for those five years. The administration cost has not gone up. It's remained the same over the, the term of the contract. Right, and I think what's significant to note with this contract, in addition to the management fees over the course of that five years, we'll also be covering claims. In prior years, BCPS's claims were considerably low due to the COVID pandemic and um, reviewing our claims over the course of five years, we needed to make this modification because our employees are actually back to work. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Mr. Kuhn, is that, a, is that a comment or a question on chat? Uh, so we discussed this in the meeting yesterday, and I believe Mr. Hartlove basically said that the administrative costs and the claims are all lumped together in the $54 million amount. So I, I believe it's already been addressed. Correct. Okay. Correct. Thank you. Ms. Gober, can we have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Jalowski? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Assam? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. F favor is eight. The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendation of the board's policy review committee? No second is needed since the recommendation comes Rod, from the committee. I'm sorry. You're not going to let me read my thing? We've already done that. We're on I got end. ahead of myself. The next item on the agenda is unfinished business, consideration of board policies, and for that I call on policy review committee chair, Ms. Rowe. Members of the board, the Policy Review Committee asks that the board accept the committee's recommendation to amend the following policies. Policy 8500, internal board policies, evaluation, board self-evaluation. Policy 8501, internal board policies, evaluation, superintendent evaluation. This recommendation is presented to you on tonight's agenda as Exhibit M. Now, do I have a motion to adopt the recommendation of the board's Policy Review Committee? No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. So moved, Roe. Any discussion? Ms. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Vice Chair. Uh, so on page 1, line 21, uh, the policy says that annually in April, the board will update its self-assessment instrument to include metrics as determined by the board. And then it goes on, number 2, annually in May, the board will conduct a self-assessment based upon the metrics and instruments selected by the board. Um, when we discussed this in policy review, I believe that we discussed um, and that there was consensus, but correct me if I'm wrong, that it, it would not be effective to um, update the self-assessment tool in April and then hold uh, the board accountable for those metrics in May, but rather it should be uh, done prior to the start of the year. So. Uh, can we I'm just change sure that? I'm not sure if that is actually what we agreed on in PRC. Do we have Ms. Howie present? Yes, ma'am, I'm present. Ms. Howie, do you recall um, what was agreed yes, on in PRC committee as to this um, timing and if the document reflects that? Recollection, ma'am, is that there was concern with the timing because of the involvement of the student member. And that was the reason that the timing was changed. It was initially May, June, and July, and it's now April, May, and June. Okay, that is how I recollect it as well. Okay, so I certainly recall Can the dis see your document. Certainly. And I certainly recall the discussion and support the discussion and the changes that were made to include the student member of the board in the evaluation. Um, so that was, uh, and that makes sense. But just in terms of um, the board, just like students, just like staff, you set the metrics ahead of time, then you try and reach 
Okay, so the true. issue that you raised was that the document did not align with what happened in PRC, and we've confirmed that the document does align with PRC. So if you're trying to make a motion to change what the document says now, that's a different issue. Thank you. Um, I would like to make a motion that the we amend policy 8500 on line 21 to change, to delete the word April and insert July. I'm sorry, we're going to create metrics after we're supposed to report them to the community? Like you want to do this July? For the August. upcoming school year. So then it would be for the upcoming school year. The new school. That makes no sense. Based on our discussions in PRC, what you're suggesting, I just can't even follow it. So if I can clarify, uh, the board would set its goals. We typically have a board retreat in July. So the new student member of the board would be in that retreat. We would set the goals for the school year. The school year would move along. And then in May, the board would conduct the self-assessment based upon those metrics. So set the metrics in July, do the self-assessment in May. When does this get sent to the public? Uh, then the next month in June. It says, paragraph three, no later than June of each school year, the board will create and publish for the public a plan to address areas for improvement identified in the self-evaluation. I want to read something Ms. Howie shared with us on chat. Ms. Howie presented the policy for which amendments had been made at the March 30th, 2022 meeting. By consensus of the committee, policy 8500 will be further amended to strike May from page one, line 21, and insert April to strike June and insert May from page one, line 24, to strike July from page one, line 27, and insert June. Additionally, on page one, line 29, the committee agreed to strike the words deficiency and insert the words of areas of improvement. By consensus of the committee, 8,500 will be sent to the full board for full reader as amended. So that was discussed in Public uh, Policy Review Committee on August 16th. I continue to support what the committee decided. Ms. Ray, would you repeat that? So this is what the committee decided, is that it would be, the timeline would be April, May, so that the student member of the board would have the ability to participate, having had any experience being a student member of the board. Um, and so the document, as it's published, does align with what the policy review committee did. What Ms. Causey wants is to edit the policy in session now and alter what the committee did, which she has the ability to make a motion and do. I'm just not on board with it. There's thank, a motion. Thank on you the for floor. that clarification. There's a motion on the floor. Do we have a second for that motion? I, Is it Ms. Causey's motion? It's Ms. Causey's motion. Would okay. you put that in chat, Ms. Causey? So we also have a motion already on the floor to approve. Ms. Causey made a motion to amend. To amend the, right. Okay. And we're waiting to see if there's a second to that motion to amend. If not, then we will proceed to the main motion. Second, so but that doesn't make it less than one. It seemed like we got which much. I forget how to do it. Second, okay. Want me to read it first? Sure. Okay. 
Okay. I move the policy 8500 okay. amended to remove on line 21 the word April and replace with July. Okay. Ms. Causey wrote in the chat, I move the policy 8500 amended to remove on line 21 the word April and replace with July. Do we have a second? No second to the amendment. So the, the amendment fails, and now we go back to the main motion. The amendment fails. I'm sorry, Ms. Causey. And then we go back to the original. Uh, we were in a discussion. Ms. Hassan, did you have your hand raised? I know it. Thank you. Thank you. It was regarding the amendment, which is no longer on the floor. Okay. Any further discussion? Doesn't appear to be. Uh, Ms. Gober, may we have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Dulesky? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Favor Z. Motion carries. The next item on the agenda is the transportation update, and for that, I call on Dr. Yarborough. Good evening again, Vice Chair McMillian, members of the board, Dr. Williams. The purpose of tonight's transportation update is to educate, inform, and provide a brief report on the current state of BCPS transportation. Our vision is to continuously improve the safety, efficiency, and effectiveness of the services we provide. To that end, BCPS has actively worked throughout the spring and summer to respond to transportation challenges. Our ongoing work has included a thorough review of our current practices and needs to increase efficiency. As you know, we hired two consultants who are transportation experts to support our efforts. We have used the identified recommendations to engage in a series of collaborative meetings with staff, students, and parents to solicit and incorporate stakeholder feedback. The input of stakeholders has helped to guide our work. With the goal of improved efficiencies, including timely arrival of transportation services, communication with stakeholders, and consistent responses to bus behavioral infractions, the Office of Transportation has worked tirelessly to maximize safety, overcome driver shortages, leverage technology, and we are now working daily to measure quality and reliability. With the full support of the Board of Education and County Executive, we were able to announce a competitive compensation package for bus drivers and attendants that included flexible hours for part-time work, retire rehire rate commensurate with experience, and a $150 monthly attendance incentive in addition to the previously announced $2 per hour increase, removal of pre-employment barriers, and referral incentives. This summer, we move forward with an all-hands-on-deck approach to hiring for transportation, hand-in-hand -hand with human resources. The hard work of our great partners in HR who joined us in being creative and innovative with recruitment to tools and locations resulted in hiring a total of 30 school additional bus drivers since August 17th. 36 BCPS contractor drivers prior to the opening of schools. Our hiring efforts continue. We also currently have 44 drivers in the pre-employment process, meaning that they are completing their physicals, drug testing, fingerprinting, and background check. Special thanks to the Office of Transportation and BCPS support staff recruitment team. Late spring, we provided a list of service adjustments to improve efficiency. This slide details all of the actions and enhancements that were completed in preparation for the start of the school year. Process improvements in technology, communication, and efficiencies have helped to improve services this fall. To date, 
We have reviewed and reset routing procedures and practices, implemented two-way bus radios as both safety and efficiency upgrades, piloted mobile and web-based application for upgraded communication and real-time data. The community component of the app began with three elementary schools. They all have received specific login communication from the Office of Transportation, updated discipline routing and infraction consequence guidance that includes a range of consequences for dangerous and or repeat behaviors, including removal from the bus. We review weekly reports for consistency and to ensure follow through. Our commitment to Team BCPS was to improve services and to be responsive. During the first week, two weeks of school, we secured additional support to help the office respond to parent inquiries. Each of transportation's five geographic areas is staffed with customer service clerks and an additional centralized customer service support call center. It is not unusual for the Office of Transportation Customer Service to handle thousands of emails and phone calls at the beginning of the school year. They did that job masterfully from August 22nd through September 23rd. The Transportation Call Center receives calls daily from 6 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. on school days and inquiries all days to the email transportation contact us at bcps.org. All of those emails are answered within 48 business hours. As a reminder, call center phone calls are automatically placed in a queue and answered in the order received when families call during peak operation hours. Bless you. Since Tuesday 13th, school administrators have received AM and PM notification of bus changes and delays. Based on feedback from all stakeholders, the Office of Transportation changed its reporting and accountability procedures and is providing more concise and timely information to schools. While the Office of Transportation is continuing to improve procedures, they report AM changes and delays to all schools by 7.05 AM and 1.55 PM for day, uh, afternoon changes. Further enhancements to the communication process will include the posting of bus changes and delays to the BCPS website in the upcoming weeks. While all services are not perfect, we are receiving positive feedback from families and schools. The Office of Transportation operates approximately 2,100 trips in the, in the morning and the same in the afternoon every school day. Examination of our data for September 13th through October 10th, looking at morning and afternoon routes, reveal the following. On average, roughly 23 morning trips are reported as delayed, reflecting less than 2% of our morning trips. An average of 41 afternoon trips are, were reported as delayed for the 17 school days. A closer look at the duration of these delays indicated out of the 416 total morning delays over those 18 days, more than 60%, 63.9% were reported as 30 minutes or less. For the afternoon, we had 700 total delays over 17 days with the same percentage reported as 30 minutes or less. It's important to note that the information on this slide represents one moment of time. If a change occurs after the posting of information, the Office of Transportation calls the school directly to provide an update. We have been tracking an average of four to 5% changes after reporting during the last 17 to 18 days. This might be shortening the window of when a bus is going to arrive, and in some cases, the bus is further delayed for another 10 to 15 minutes, but calling the school immediately to share that information. In summary, our priorities are increased efficiency, timely service, maximize safety, and enhance communication. Long-term solutions include, but are not limited to, 
system-wide confirmation of ridership, examination of secondary non-transported distances, review of school start times with healthy school start times guidance from the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American Medical Association, and adoption of tablet technology for safety, routing, reporting, apps, and student ability to check in and out. More information regarding our progress will be shared next quarter. We will continue to share information with Team BCPS from the system, Office for Transportation, and schools to ensure that all stakeholders remain informed. Plans and updates will be communicated through the methods listed on this slide to ensure that we continue to respond to the needs of Team BCPS. Thank you for your support. Turn it over if there are any questions. I'll start off with a question, Dr. Yarborough. Yes. It appears to me that you're possibly assuming the uh, direct leadership of the Transportation Department. Is that correct? Uh, the Department of Transportation is one of the departments that I supervise. Can you provide us an update on the timeline for hiring a new director? Sure. Without violating any uh, personnel rules, I can share with you that first-level interviews were held and second-level interviews are scheduled this week. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Rowe. I just want to say that you've done a great job and that the feedback in the community reflects that. I mean, it's not perfect, but it's definitely far improved from last year. Thank you. I will share that feedback with the hardworking members of transportation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Ms. Dr. Hager. Oh, um, sure. So um, I want to hone in on the school start times for uh, um, that you mentioned that you were, it's kind of a long-term goal. Um, and I know that I've mentioned this before and that we've talked about it. And I, I do appreciate that you're looking to, you know, use the guidance that exists around healthy school start, start times. But I believe that one of our consultants that we have hired is one that has worked with other school systems that have been able to put into place healthy school start times, not as a long-term goal, but an actual something that's happening. Um, and my concern is that we will utilize the the expertise of this um, consultant and and get things back off the ground and then lose their expertise when without actually having addressed that. So can you speak more specifically about when you hope to address this and kind of what's being done to to uh, get a handle on early? healthy school start times? Absolutely, thank you for that question. So some of the steps that we've taken are to review the reports that have already been conducted in neighboring school systems, um, including uh, Anne Arundel County that just implemented this year. We also are convening a group of stakeholders. One of uh, the members of the um, PTSA, the um, Council of PTAs, has also um, shared information as she has been instrumental in moving this work forward for the University of Maryland as well as a neighboring school system. And so there will be a convening of a group very soon. It is not our intention to delay for years. It's our intention to study, to look at the impact, to um, solicit the input of stakeholders, and to move forward with um, our next steps, sharing, providing an update by next quarter. And I'll just um, add that we have a really stellar local school health council in Baltimore County that includes many pediatricians and stakeholders that are in very knowledgeable about this topic. And uh, it's you know, co-chaired by uh, Ms. Somerville and a uh, community pediatrician as well. So just another resource as, as you look into this of folks who are invested in the county who could, who could be an asset um, as we have these discussions. Thank you. I have noted them. They will be a part. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Causey. Thank you. Um, number one, I wanted to thank you for this report, and I wanted to uh, thank Dr. Williams and all you and all the staff that are working on the transportation problem. Uh, this is one of the most robust reports in my eight years of being a board member. Um, and seeing the 2% of uh, delays, um, plus or minus 5%, uh, but that is um, definitely Number one, good to see the numbers and then to strive for further improvement. So um, I really appreciate that. Um, 
I want to dovetail with Dr. Hager about the Safe School Start Time. Uh, we've heard so much in our public comment about discipline, and that is one of the factors uh, that the um, Safe and Healthy uh, School Start Time uh, group has um, documented their research. And Dr. Hager could probably quote a website or something. But um, <clears throat> also, BCPS already did a um, had a task force that presented results in 2019, saying that indeed later start times for secondary schools would be helpful for students. Um, and so uh, I would really encourage a, a near-term solution, as Dr. Hager said. So I'm glad to hear a report will come uh, in the next quarter. Um, the question I had is the update time. So some students are at bus stops before 7 o'clock, especially in districts like mine. There's a lot of areas where the kids are on buses um, for quite a bit of time early in the morning. So is there any uh, other information that can get to those students sooner? So I think our goal is to make sure that it gets out as early as possible, ultimately to have the app so that everyone has at their fingertip what the time is. But the reality is we take the 11 areas and everyone reports in. The good part of the report that we've been watching is that many of um, the entries on the report are the bus number changes with no delay. Um, and so that I will say that the area that you're talking about, you know, I have had the opportunity to review that. I have not noted, um, you know, a pattern of delays, but our goal is to improve that timing with the enhanced um, technology. 655 is by the time we make sure that we quality check all the 11 areas to make sure that what they're reporting is as accurate as possible in that moment. But certainly the goal would be to get to real time reporting for everyone. I mean, our next interim step will be to post it on the website so that, you know, families and students can just look on their phone and see uh, to make a decision. And that's coming that step within the next few weeks. And so is this reporting done uh, without the involvement of the principal? So it's directly from transportation to uh, the families? So right now it's directly from um, transportation. It goes to the school. It includes the principal, assistant principal, and any other designee that the school has identified. Um, I've seen many schools use Twitter and other social media where they'll post no delays or they'll post 15 minutes um, for bus such and such. Our next interim step will continue to do that, but we also will have front facing where anyone, um, you know, family, students can click on the link and see the changes um, right there. Okay, because that'll be helpful. We know the uh, schoolhouse manages a lot, and it would be great if we can take any work off their plate. So thank you for That's that. Okay, Mr. Kuhn is next, and then we'll get Ms. Rowe. Mr. Kuhn. Oh, thank you. Um, I wanted to follow up on the questions that uh, Dr. Hager came up with. Um, and I, I know, I, I believe you stated that there was a group being pulled together and that there would be some type of output in the near future. Um, do can you actually give us a timeline? Um, is is the timeline set? Are these plans that are actually set at this point in time, or is this just coming together? So, in terms of membership of the group uh, invitation and the timeline to report back to the board, which will be, um, you know, uh, towards the end of first quarter, that is set. Um, when the group comes together, I, as I said right now, we have uh, reviewed all of the reports that are around us and also spoken to an expert who's had experience at University of Maryland as well as a neighboring district. Um, they will make some recommendations which we'll be able to share with you um, this quarter. All right, I, I, I just ask because this board has limited time, <laughs> the people you're talking to. Um, will no longer be in these positions, or most of them won't be in positions after uh, the end of November. And I know that folks are very interested in this topic, uh, so um, I'm sure we'll be talking about it more in the near future. But I, I just want to, uh, you know, press that upon everybody that um, 
I know I mentioned in the last meeting, I believe that I would like this to be a topic of discussion, an agenda item, uh, and I will continue to push for that. Um, thank you. Ms. Rowe. Dr. Yarbrough, do you, um, I didn't hear an estimate about when you think that app is gonna roll out to everyone. So I don't have an estimate yet. So we moved from 11 routes to, um, I'm gonna get the numbers wrong, maybe 45 routes. Now we're at 145 routes. We're piloting at three schools. Mm -hmm. um, if everything is successful simultaneously, we're also working with the uh, procurement and put out um, the bids. We will come to you for your approval for next step. Mm -hmm. um, I can get back to you with the uh, exact timeline, but now we're, you know, we're, we're watching to see how user friendly it is for parents and the feedback that we get to inform our next practices. So what we roll out really meets the needs of all of our families, but I can give you a, a okay. tighter timeline um, in a report through Dr. Williams. And it didn't escape my notice that you looked at transportation routing reports yourself. I do. I don't think anyone's ever done that before. Not, not at your level. I would just offer, Ms. Rowe, people didn't report out, but we do want to acknowledge the work yeah. of our former director of transportation as well as Dr. Yarbrough, which this is one of her responsibilities. Thank you. There doesn't appear to be any other questions. Thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is an information item which includes the minutes of the June 13th Southeast Area Educational Advisory Council meeting. The next item on the agenda is board comments and agenda setting. Let's do that at one time and we'll just go around once and we'll be done. Ms. Rowe? I have no comments. Thank you. You're going to help me be on time, you know that. Ms. Causey. Good evening. So uh, I want to dovetail with uh, earlier, there's a number of um, appreciations uh, and awarenesses that need to take place uh, this month in October it, with Hispanic Heritage Month, Principal Appreciation Month, School Custodian Appreciation. We know how important that is, <laughs> taking care of the buildings with all of our children running through them. Um, Learning Disabilities Awareness Day, and um, interestingly, I got an email today about a parent concerned um, uh, that there was not uh, diagnostics happening as quickly as possible, so that will be forwarded to staff, um, but we certainly do want to try and raise awareness, but also um, for the school system to do its part in, in that very, very critical diagnosis as early as we can. Um, one thing I did want to talk about um, tonight is just briefly is um, it was uh, mentioned by another board member that there are several of us that will not be returning to the board um, after uh, late November. There are the elections this year for seven board members um, aligning with the seven county council districts. And I would just encourage all parents and staff and community members uh, to look into those elections and to get engaged and to carefully evaluate uh, who is running, but also to, you know, really see how uh, you can get engaged in supporting the school system through becoming aware. Uh, there are websites where one can go and look at um, uh, questions that have been filled out by candidates. Uh, one is the uh, League of Women Voters, uh, in Baltimore County, and so you can go to www.lwv.org. There's a number of um, media outlets that have surveys that they've done. So I would just appreciate uh, and encourage people to get engaged. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Dolosky. Um I do want to especially applaud all of the improvements in transportation. I know it's not in and you have worked really hard. And additionally, um, all of the communication about um, what's going well in the school system and also the challenges that we face are really appreciated, especially all of the parents that are coming forth with genuine concerns about the safety and well-being of their children. And you are all heard. And we will keep working to move forward and improve things as they are. But thank you, everybody, for your hard work. Thank you. Ms. Hassan? 
Thank you. So I have nothing um, further. I do want to piggyback off of Ms. Causey and remind everyone to vote. Um, if you're a resident in Baltimore County over the age of 18, please get involved in your local elections. I promise you they carry just as much weight, if not more, as the ones you see on television, such as national elections. So please get out and vote and most importantly, educate yourself about elections and about who's running and, and vote for the candidate in which um, you believe in. And I guess to end every meeting the same way that I do, let's get in some good trouble. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Offerman. I'd like to comment that uh, a lot has been said about school safety, and I certainly think that's the most important topic we can probably talk about. But I would also like to uh, say that I think an awful lot of the problems in school start in the community. So I would ask parents and guardians and uh, interested citizens to contact schools if they are concerned about a potential problem. And that might help us, uh, that might help us uh, deal with it before it becomes a violent situation. Thank you, that's all. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Dr. Hager. Um, yes, I, I uh, thank you, Mr. Offerman. You made some very, very good points. Um, and I also want to just echo what Mrs. Sonimus Causey said about voting. And um, I'm just looking at the timeline, and, and we all only have a few weeks remaining, and it's only a few weeks until the election. So please, please do your uh, research and look into the candidates and certainly get out there and vote. And that's all. Thanks. Mr. Kuhn. Uh, thank you. Um, budget committee meeting. Uh, will be on the next budget committee meeting is on October 19th. Um, I believe it's at 5 p.m. Um, we'll be discussing blueprint money um, in the next budget. Uh, so if you want to learn a little bit more about that, you're welcome to join. Um, there's a lot going on, right? School is basically in full swing. Um, Seniors, along with their parents, are in the throes of preparing and getting their um, applications in for college. And uh, you know, sports are are certainly you know moving along. So I just uh, you know want to share as a parent that you know there's a lot of anxiety in this time, and for people to just take a few deep breaths uh, and enjoy the moment with your seniors. Um, they'll be moving forward before you know it, um, and uh, enjoy your time with them. Thank you. Thank you. I'm chairman of the audit committee. We meet next Tuesday, one week from today, October 18th, from 4.30 to 6 o'clock. The last item on the agenda is announcements. The board's next meeting will be held on Tuesday, October 25th, 2022, at 6.30 p.m. Thank you for joining us tonight. The meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.